rub the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, gotta love it, love it or not. I'm hot from the hop to the rub the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with everybody. Cause it's Friday, you ain't got no job, and you ain't got shit to do. Oh, yes. Indeed. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. I'm your boy, MJ. If this is your first time tuning in, please do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Subscription doesn't cost anything. Bink, hit that notification bell. That way you're on top of all my podcasts that I had come out with. You know, <clears throat> I have them every Thursday, six o'clock. But due to circumstances yesterday for our guest, we had to switch it up to today. So we have this going down on a Friday night tonight. I feel great. I'm excited. No more uh, for tonight. No more the, oh man, Thursday feels like Friday. Hell no. Tonight is Friday. We're getting shit going and I'm super excited. Shout out to all my early birds. People are cracking up in the comments right now. I, I can't wait to say what up to you guys, man. Uh, before, before we get started, you know what the deal is, man. For the freshest and best is delivered to your doorstep. That's www.coldbloodedcafe.com. Uh, $30 flat rate shipping. You cannot go wrong, man. Straight quality to your doorstep. You got eggs, put them inside of a sim box, man. Everyone I know uses sim boxes, man. Sim containers where they're at. Super simple. Less steps you got to use. Higher chances of you hatching that out of the, hatching that egg inside of a sim box. I'll tell you that right now. Shout out to my boy, Ozzy Boyd's. LLC, man, if you want an investment, you want to step your ball python game up, you're looking for the right move to make, visit my boy Ozzy. You're not going to go wrong, man. Ozzy Boyd's the truth. Facts. Facts, man. Future of enclosures, man. Focus Q Habitats. They are now coming out with open face enclosures, you know, like four by twos and stuff. Um, I saw something that they sampled on their uh, on their page, on their Instagram. So go, vo go visit Focus Cube Habitats. See what they're all about. See what they have going on. Uh, I know Reptech has a bunch of their enclosures. I got an enclosure on, on the way. You don't want to sleep on Focus Cube Habitats. They are the future of enclosures. And what's been the future of enclosures, just killing it since the 90s, that's the original Freedom Breeder stainless steel racks. Shout out to Jesse. Shout out to everyone at the Freedom Breeder crew for sponsoring the channel. And then, of course, I have yet to get the logo from the big homie himself, the big dog, big SA, Miguel Garcia, always at always evolving, over at Always Evolving Pythons. I appreciate your sponsor, dog. I really do. You're the man. I know you're doing big things right now. I think you're like saving dogs or something right now. So, man, I love you for that. I fucking love dogs. Man, I appreciate that. But yeah, man, shout out to all the sponsors, everyone in the early bird. I mean, all the comments. I'm going to say what up. Who's in, who's in the comments right here? Oh, yeah, of course. I can always count on my homie Mike to be one of the first comments all the time. What up to my homie Mike at 1776 Exotics? Thanks for tuning in. What's up, homie? Savage Beauty Exotics uh, Patreon OG right there. Thanks for being here tonight, man. I appreciate it. Friday night. Primitive Reptiles. What's up, man? Tasty Hills Herp. What's up, Tasty Hills? The General up in the building, man. Martin, thank you so much for joining the Patreon, bro. And he's going to be one of the captains in the group. I'm telling you, this is my boy right here. Uh, we have a lot to learn from my man, uh, Martin. And I'm, I'm not talking about snakes. I'm just general, general in life, man. The guy's been through a lot, and he's 
he's fucking a huge support and i appreciate you martin thank you so much man uh om reptiles from norway we got norway in the building man i love it when i see europe here man when i see a europe european visiting the trap man i just know that this is global we're global that's what i that's what i'm talking about man global global that's what, that's what i mean man thank you so much for being here tonight snowy pie or snowy i'm sorry snow pythons what's up snow pythons black smoke smoke reptiles Homegirl Mindy Boyer up in the fucking building. What's up, Mindy? The homie Jason Holbrook, man. The fucking the stylist, the hairstylist in Indianapolis. Make sure you hit up my boy, man. There's a bunch of people up in the comments. Oh, I got to say what up the homie Tucker. Tucker. Check out my homie Tucker. Uh, Purple Rain Reptiles has a lot of great Condro projects going on. Um, he's super excited about this fucking guest tonight. I'll tell you that right now. Um, He's all week. Hey, man, we're going to be talking about Nido. We're going to talk about Nido. Oh, my God. Of course, this is Cody Bartolini. Of course, we're going to bring up Nido a little bit. Now, we got to direct this. You know, I there, I have a few topics I want to get, you know, out of out of Cody tonight. But we don't have 12 hours, okay? We do have a few hours, but we don't have 12. So I have to direct this as good as I can. Nido, definitely one of the topics that we're going to talk to tonight. So be ready for that, Tucker. Everyone else, just be ready for a great show tonight. Because ever since I've got, gotten the ple pleasure to meet uh, Cody, um, man, I'm, I'm telling you right now, yes, every conversation I have is more than an hour on the phone with him. But I leave with so much information. And and I also like regroup on like how I see things in this hobby. Um Shout out, you know, shout out and rest in peace to Forrest Fanning. But Forrest was the reason why I met Cody and also respect Cody so much is because how much Forrest always looked up to Cody and fucking respected Cody. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to that. I always look up to whoever, you know, whoever my mentor looks up to. I immediately look up to that person, you know, because, you know, why the fuck would they waste their time? Right. And um, Cody's just been one of those guys, man. And uh, he's, you know, I, I don't feel like he's as known as he should be. But that's going to change because he's here tonight. He's tapping in from Florida and he's representing the Reptile Preservation Institute, Cody Bartolini. What's up, Cody? Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm so stoked you're here, bro. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm good, man. It's been uh, it's been a week. It's been a week, but they all are, you know, busy burning the candle at both ends and, and have been for probably the last decade plus or so. Yeah, Cody, you're nonstop, man. And and like honestly, I'm so happy we got to pull this episode off because I feel like, you know, doing something that's not live is easy for you. You know what I mean? Because, you know, like because you have a lot of things that popped up. Like last last night, uh, you had to go to the airport and pick up two rattlesnakes, or can you kind of run us through what happened last night, what you had to go through or yesterday? Oh man. Um, yeah, so I mean it started out uh earlier in the day we were um you know so we had to, we were expecting some new uh crocodilian um uh, uh lose my train of thought new new crocodilian acquisitions to the collection that that's the word I was looking for acquisitions that were uh coming in from Dallas World Aquarium in Texas and uh these animals were, uh, uh, they're about, they're about two years old and, uh, fairly, fairly large. They're more, the more let's crocodiles. We got, uh, six more let's crocodiles that, that, uh, that came from Dallas world aquarium and about two years old, but pretty good size for two year old animals. Um, you know, around three, three feet, uh, uh, you know, maybe 40, 42 inches and, uh, they're going into, they've gone into an outdoor enclosure that's uh 20 feet by 20 feet we have a nine foot pool in there that's uh that's 30 inches deep and we were just uh you know getting things planted and and adding additional fencing in into the enclosure because uh the fencing that we have is made for a larger crocodilian so you know your alligator or crocodile um you know or caiman everybody in the crocodilian uh, complex but these enclosures are made for for larger animals, so the fact that these uh, the, the the bars on the um, on the fence, uh, the, the openings are made for a larger animal. Uh, so the fact that these were smaller animals, we just wanted to make sure that the enclosure was extra secure. So we got even smaller wire where the animal there's no chance of an animal being able to put its head in or anything like that, and and sticking the fence and make making sure that the animals can't uh, dig out or, or crawl through or anything like that. So so um, so Cody, I want to go ahead and like for the people who really don't know about your background and and whatnot, you know, and and you know because you have so much. 
about your background that's extensive of why you do what you do. So, I mean, I, we don't need to go exactly too much into detail, but, you know, as far as like, you know, what you do now, right? Like what, like, let's talk about the beginning stages as far as why you're into preservation, like what, like why it is you're so like, cause what you represent and what you do is a day-to-day -day thing. Like you're fuck, it's like a religion to you. Right. But something built to that passion. Right. Um, you know, because like, let's, let's, let's like, for, like, for instance, there's a lot of things that in the hobby that shouldn't be done, but people do it any do it anyways. Right. And you have, you have a lot of lessons learned from that and shit. Right. So let's, let's kind of go back to, you know, your, the, the beginning of your like, you know, animal reptile keeping career. Like if we can even go like, let's just say when you met Forrest, like that, like that era, you know, cause that's when shit kind of got thick and like really intense, right? When you and Forrest met or. Yeah, I mean, it's always kind of been ever since I was a little kid, you know, I'll, I'll go, I'll go through it briefly and then we could go back and, and, and go into some more detailed explanation. Okay. So, you know, be, because I, you know, I, I, tend to like to give the backstory on the backstory, which you know, everybody makes fun of, of me for not being able to land the plane because I'll, I'll, I'll add a story on top of the story to explain the story that I'm talking about. And then you'll end up forgetting why we were even talking about the one thing from the beginning. So I'll kind of breeze through the history of, of my interest in reptiles to the point of forest and then uh, the zoo career and everything moving forward from there. So we could kind of try to break it back into bullet bullet points, which is very hard for me to do because I speak in paragraphs, not bullet points. So, um, but my, uh, did you want to say something before I go? Cause I'll take a breath and I'll be talking for 10 minutes. So I just want to give you a chance to speak now or forever. Hold your peace. Let's go, man. No, you're, you're you got the floor. Let's hear it. All right. So, uh, I was born in Las Vegas, Nevada. That's where I grew up. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's a uh, you know it's Las Vegas. It's the it's everything that everybody probably thinks it is and more. Um, but uh, as as a kid, uh, you know you can't do all the fun stuff that you can do as an adult there. So when I was a little kid growing up, um, you know it wasn't as developed as a city. You know you had the strip and 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 all that all that stuff, the casinos and the gambling and all of that stuff. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the city wasn't all that developed. So there's a lot of desert still, a lot of vacant lots and a lot of areas to look for reptiles. Um, so I remember one of the, the kids at my school brought in a banded gecko, a uh, little coleonyx gecko and, uh, that he caught in the vacant lot. And I remember seeing this little velvety gecko and being just completely enamored by this animal and then you know ever since then i was out running in the vacant lots with with everybody looking for night lizards and spiny lizards and, and geckos and you know whatever kind of anything that you could find and and you know at that time i'm not able you know there's you don't have the computer access and the information and stuff that you do today so my information uh, typically came from the the local school library, you know, the, the second it was library day, I'd beeline for the reptile books, you know, all 10 books that I had to pick from and, uh, you know, start my you know, education on, on reptiles. As everybody started growing out of reptiles, you know, because when you're a little kid, you're catching lizards and stuff and some people grow out of it, some people never do. I was one of those people that never, never did and always maintained a huge fascination with it. And before I realized that you had to you know grow up and get a job and make money and make a living i knew that that's what i wanted to do uh you know it was it was something very easy for me but i just needed to figure out how to how to get there i was fortunate enough to live around the corner from exotic pets ken foos who uh managed exotic pets he recently passed away but he was a huge influence on me as a child um you know yeah. he was like an uncle you know to me growing up and, uh, you know, I'd always be in the pet store getting different things, you know, as a little kid, my parents were always, uh, very supportive of the reptile, uh, habit and always had an extra room in the, every house that we lived in that was completely dedicated, uh, for reptiles. So, um, you know, and, and I went through all of the, all the different reptiles you could imagine, especially back then when a lot of the stuff that was being imported and, you know, when monkeys monkey tailed skinks were still $30 and nobody cared about them, you know, that kind of, those kind of days. So it was pretty fun. Um, and, uh, ever since, ever since then, you know, I, I had always been just completely obsessed with, with reptiles. 
um, and and moving forward from from there, um, you know, breeding various colubrids and keeping you know this bow and that bow and this python and that python. Uh, venomous reptiles were always something that uh, had interest me since I was a little kid. And uh, looking in those those classroom books, you know, venom or uh, you know, snakes of the world and and all of those kind of you know, I remember David Tracy Barker, the you know, pythons of the world, you know, volume one, you know, seeing the the rough scale python, the carinata, and there were only a handful of specimens known at the time, and just just all those very uh, eclectic species. But just looking at a venomous snake, you know, looking at a the picture of a rhino viper, and you're just looking at at that animal. And you just can't even believe that that animal actually exists somewhere. You know, it was before before it was cool. Be, before it was, you know, it's, it's, it's always it's always been cool, right? Because they're amazing. But but before, yeah. you know, social media and all the flair and all of the oh the, the danger involved and, and all of that stuff. You know, as a kid that doesn't know any better on what's cool or not cool or in or not in, it was those animals that attracted me to them. And I always like to reference the difference between like an interest in aquarium saltwater fish and, 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 and freshwater fish, you know, as a, as a beginning uh, aquaculturist, you may be uh, getting into the freshwater stuff, various things like cichlids and kind of homing your skills on keeping freshwater animals. There's a lot of beautiful freshwater fish, but there's nothing like looking at that saltwater aquarium, going to an aquarium and seeing sharks and anemones and lionfish and a butt at a porcupine puffer you know so the venomous snakes were like the saltwater fish of of the reptile world to me there was just that feeling that i got looking at them and that was just it you know it wasn't about the the deadliness of the animal it wasn't what they you know how, how many you know elephants that they could kill or how many humans that they could kill with you know a drop of venom it was a sincere interest in the animals and the venom is fascinating too, you know, especially the medical, uh, the research aspect of it on, on, on so many things we still don't know that could benefit humans or, or, or other living things because of snake venom, obviously anti-venom um, and all of that, that stuff is, is, is obviously very interesting, but the animals themselves are, are what are truly fascinating to me. I love the ecology and the biology the uh, you know the geography of the animals. I'm really into the areas of where a lot of these venomous species come from, especially the montane animals uh, that live in high elevation cloud forests and and their special adapted way of life. Um, you know, so so when I was a little kid, I, I was I was hooked on that. But then you know I had to figure out how to get there. Um, I'm going to come up for air. I don't know if there's anything on your mind that you're thinking right now. No, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I, I like, honestly, this is the second time I've heard this, but it's like, it, it, like I couldn't get it all. So this is awesome because now I'm kind of just like, I'm, it's, I'm putting the pieces back to what you first told me. So I'm just listening. This is great. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do want to, cause it's great that you brought up the whole analogy of the venomous being like this, like the, the, the uh, saltwater fish of the hobby. Right. But in generality, in generality, the way I look at it is like in fish in general. Do you hold fish? Like technically, you don't you hold fish. fish. You typically, you can, but are you supposed? I mean, who the fuck wants to hold a fish? That's terrible. Like a fish, that's you're not supposed to like unless well, you're the, uh, a bag. You know what I mean? But you're not typically holding fish unless there's a purpose, probably veterinarian uh, or or other. There's got to be, you know, maybe some scientific research, tagging, or doing. Doing something of meaning, not just to hold it, just just to hold it. Okay, now it's, uh, to enjoy. Thank you. Now, I from what I understand, and pretty goddamn legend of you, you've bred black mambas before, correct? Yeah, actually, uh, we just we just produced them not too long ago for the the third time. So this this year is the third time that we produced black mambas. That yeah. is so fucking sick. By the way, <laughs> that is so sick. <laughs> I just think that's amazing. So let's yeah. Let's talk Let's talk about Cody. I want to know how you got to the point where you were breeding black mambas, okay? Because when the hell were you? When did you first start breeding venomous? Okay, um, really, um, I didn't start uh, truly breeding venomous in, until Florida. Until until we, I moved to Florida in two thousand and nine. Um, to, in two thousand and ten. 
Um, I got my uh, foot in the door at St. Augustine Alligator Farm, a zoological park in St. Augustine, Florida, uh, one of the world's most well-recognized zoological facilities for crocodilia. Uh, they, they have all 24 recognized, current recognized species of crocodilia. Um, there, are, there are more, there are, there are being, um, they're being separated out into different species as we speak. There are two different species of slender sided crocodiles now, two different species of Nile crocs, and so on and so forth. But, but, but currently, um, St. Augustine has a complete collection of crocodilia. But when, when I moved uh, to Florida and I got my foot into the zoo field, which was the, um, which was the, my, my goal as a kid is to, you know, keeping these animals and working with, um, you know, privately with, with venomous species it was all just kind of training for the big game of um getting getting into the zoological field and 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 becoming a professional herpetologist was was really what i dreamed of as a kid was uh working for a zoological facility um there's something very prestigious about zoos i've always really loved zoos um the professionalism that comes with um, a professional zoo herpetologist uh, when you talk to, to somebody that's been in the zoo field for a decade or so, or maybe just a few years, they come with a knowledge that's just uh, just really, really incredible. And I want I wanted to get into that field. But um, a, a, as I was at that zoological park, I was, um, you know, exposed to venomous reptiles that were in the collection. And I was in charge of, um, of a lot of them. And while I was at St. Augustine, I was in charge of the king cobras and uh and, and bred uh they, they bred twice uh under my care I, it's a team effort i can't take full credit like i well, i did everything you know it's a team effort uh yeah, of but uh, i was in charge of, of those of those animals and um you know with the insight of other herpetologists scott poff who is the curator of riverbanks zoo in uh south carolina i think he's retired now but he's a good friend of mine, but you know, very, very well known for his work with King Cobras and he's uh, reared um, quite a few babies and stuff. So um, a lot of uh, our success with breeding King Cobras was also attributed to advice from Scott Poff. But uh, yeah, bred King Cobras there, but uh, you know, it wasn't really necessarily something that, you know, I, I don't feel like I need to breed everything that we keep. Um, we definitely have bred certain things but it's not like we have to crank these animals out at this at this point in our in our collection um we do uh, breed certain species but it's species that um are already pre-spoken for that maybe a venom lab had special interest in a certain species and wanted us to produce those and they're going to take the entire litter or a zoological park um, is gonna, uh, you know, take something that we produce. Uh, we we don't really, um, you know, produce venomous just to just to outlet them. There, there was there was a time um, that 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 was something that was a little bit more um, uh, common. What I what I was doing, uh, you know, I I wanted to, you know, everybody has to go through the phase of I, I want to breed stuff and, and I'm gonna be a breeder. And um, so I definitely bred some, some venomous species and, and made sure that they went to the, the right people and to where legal. Um, but at this point, um, you know, we're pretty focused on working with accredited facilities and, uh, and venom labs and, and select uh, individuals in the, in the private sector um, that have proven themselves worthy to be able to properly care for these animals responsibly and, and not do foolish stuff with them. Um, <laughs> So I have to ask you, Cody, what's the process of somebody inquiring one of your black mambas or if, if that's even a possibility? Um, well, at, at this point, if it's not somebody that we don't um, already know, um, you know, they, they would have to have a, a, a particular reason on why they want to have that animal. Of course, they have to be legal uh, wherever they are to, to possess that animal. Um, but but also have experience with a, a, a mamba, you know, not just have experience with because because having a copperhead is, is not a mamba, um, having a cobra is not a mamba. It's a, it's a it's a completely different animal. And we want to know that the, those individuals have the experience um, to to properly care for them, especially you know as a baby. They don't require too large of a setup, but this is an animal that could potentially grow over twelve feet long. 
and you know could could, yeah. could strike you know you know half of its body length or more and has a has a, a extremely potent venom that can put a human down in 30 minutes if if you get a real bad bite with a lot of venom um you know so it's not just an animal that you know as we produce them all, all of our black mambas currently are going to a uh, venom lab for anti-venom production for for, for african anti-serum and probably other pharmaceutical research, but primarily anti-venom production, which is is really one of the best causes to to have that go for. You know that makes you feel really good at the end of the day that the animals that you produced are going to to help save lives. Um, you know, so so when somebody privately just wants an animal as a novelty versus it going to a venom lab where it's gonna do good, um, it's kind of hard to justify to send send an animal out but but we want to make sure that they're being legal for one um that ha they have experience with with those animals specifically and or have a conversation with that person over the phone and really get a good gauge of of their experience and knowledge because you're not going to get that over a text message or or an email um yeah that's one of our 2017 babies that was from the second second time that we produced that's right when mambas. i that your first clutch is when I start is when I stumbled across your actual account and your page. And let me tell you, man, Cody now has a Patreon page, which fuck, I've yet to even join that. I've been missing out. I told you I was going to join it back in an unfiltered rep episode. So now I just reminded myself, but I'm going to put that link in the description below because, and you told me this, but your story, you, you do story type content on your Patreon. Like the shit that you used to do before that I used to love, like you used to put like, fucking 50 stories in one day and i used to just like sit there and just like close whatever i was doing off and just watch your stories i loved your stories bro i'm telling you they were awesome you, were, you would show you would show the substrate you were using you were showing how you would mix your own substrate it was so fucking epic that's where i got all my purchase at my perch ideas but yeah go ahead i loved it well, I thank you for that. I appreciate it. One of the reasons, uh, there's a couple reasons I toned down the stories. Uh, the, the primary reason is we've just been getting so busy with projects and things. It's very hard to, to pull out your phone and film and talk about it when, uh, when you're in the middle of, of doing um, a big project. So that, that's a big one. Also, because I put so many stories on there, it really was like a... Um, like a full length video, but something that people are probably looking at while they're at work, um, you know, when they're not supposed to, right? You know, looking at a story and they don't have time to watch 50 of my videos or have it on uh, where they could hear it. And I wasn't sure, you know, I would see that, that quite a few people were watching the stories, but I don't know how many people were actually, you know, taking in the stories and enjoying them. So I'm really happy that you, um, that you were enjoying them. But one of the reasons uh, we decided, you know, I haven't been posting too much of that is because we are videoing a lot of the, the development around the facility that we're putting it on our Patreon with edited videos and pretty much all the details of what we're doing, where you could sit there with uninterrupted time. It's not skipping from one thing to the next or just having like, a 10 second clip where it cuts off what I was saying. So you could get the whole thing, you know, from start to finish, just like the third clutch of black mambas that just hatched out. We have a three part uh, video on the Patreon from when we weren't sure if she might've been an egg bound and we had to restrain her in a, in a device called the Uplex and ultrasound her. Cause we, we have our own ultrasound on site. Um, and then, then we got, uh, a, I'm going to probably give away a little bit of the stuff for the <laughs> Patreon, but maybe tease it a little bit. Then, 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 uh, turns out she wasn't egg bound and we did, we did get, uh, we did get eggs and then uh, oh, wow. we were able to hatch, uh, some of those eggs. Huge. So it's a, it's a three parter there. And we also, yeah, we also got some West African green mamba, um, eggs this year. And the, the clutch didn't go as good as the first go around. We, did have a lot of kinked animals and um, you know same incubation temperature 82 degrees that we did in 2018 on the western mambas where we had a perfect clutch of 13 hatch out with no imperfections and this clutch we had a lot of kinked animals and i, I let it get a little too wet in the egg box where the eggs were expanding um and it had those stretch marks in them where i think there might have been a little too much pressure in the egg from from all of the 
you know, uh, hydration that was absorbed and it could have been putting pressure on the developing embryo. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so hard to say because you really don't know. But same incubation temps and, and no problems the year before. And, and the, it was definitely the, the uh, uh, mixture, because I did a vermiculite mixture, was on point the year before. And I mixed it too at this go around. And um, yeah, so I, I kind of did that. But, you, you know, you, you live, you learn. And, you know, it kind of gets frustrating when, when you've done it. When you, when you get a perfect clutch and, and you, you know how to recreate that and then, you, you know, you, you get lazy about something and, um, you know, or you don't do it right. And in this case, I, I had the, the substrate mixed too wet and I let it go too long before I caught it because we got busy with other projects and usually we get eggs set them up in the incubator, set them, forget them, um, and uh, check on them every couple of weeks. And, and uh, I did end up switching out the substrate to a, to, a, to a better mixture. But I think at that point, uh, you know, 30, you know, a month in incubation, I think the, uh, the, you know, the damage might have been done. But that video is up on Patreon. I've got everything from egg collection until they hatched out. And it wasn't a perfect clutch. You know, sometimes people don't show the the not so fun times and you could tell i wasn't very happy in the video on the results of that clutch um you know because they were per when we collected them they were perfect fertile eggs perfect vein development everything was perfect there was no reason they shouldn't have hatched um it was all incubation error on my on my part and i knew better i actually had some um zilla uh jungle mix uh, that i that i ended up using as a incubation media because i um you know, I, I couldn't find the vermiculite and I couldn't find the perlite. Instead of going and getting it, I had this Zilla, Zilla mix. And you, you got to think, you know, mambas and other snakes, where do they lay their eggs in nature? Under a log, in a pile of, you know, in a termite mound, somewhere with dirt. So if you know how to mix the substrate, you technically could hatch eggs out on dirt. So I was very yeah. confident. You know, I had uh, sphagnum moss to mix in there and everything. And I was, I was very confident because the Zilla mix is a good mix. I was very confident that they were going to hatch. But, you know, where, where when I mix the water and they're unlike vermiculite where you could really feel right off the bat where yeah. you can squeeze out the water and make sure it's good. You know, right. I think it was just more water hidden in that soil mixture than I thought. And I let it go too long. And then I switched it to vermiculite and then perlite throughout the 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 duration of incubation on those western mambas and you know it, it's frustrating but there's always next year um but that's all on patreon and there's also some other really cool stuff we're doing a lot of croc enclosure builds right now and oh. i am going through the entire the entire thing for out for from our perimeter fencing to individual croc enclosures talking about our florida fish and wildlife conservation commission regulations on class one animals um, on, on what we have to do and why um, and everything. It's pretty detailed. I've got a lot of footage I got to go, you know, and I'm, I'm the one that's editing the videos. So I don't always get videos out as, on a, in a timely manner like I would like because I'm also busy working and doing all the stuff that's, um, you know, that we have to do in the day to day here, including editing videos. So I get them out when I can, but, um, but they're pretty good. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to toot my horn too, uh, you know, too much, but um, I've had a lot of positive feedback on the people that are watching the video saying they look pretty professionally edited. And the funny thing is I, I edit them all from my phone because I'm usually on the go. So I have an app on my phone where I'm editing. So I don't have any professional editing software or anything like that. I don't claim to be, you know, I have to upload the videos to get the, uh, on YouTube to put them on Patreon, but I don't consider my, you know, I don't want, I'm not a YouTuber. We're just document. You know, nothing wrong with that, but um, you know that that it's a platform that we're using to get the videos out there. But I'm not, you know, interested in in subscribers or or anything like that. I just want to, you know, for the for, for the for the people that are truly interested in what we're doing and want to learn something, um, yeah. you know, that that's why we do it. All right, cool, cool, respect. Um, now it's no secret, man. You fucking not a fan of people who free handle. Am I right? Yeah, not not a fan. Um, I I just don't see the, the 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 purpose at the end of the day. You know, 
Now, now people, you know, for instance, see it as a way of life. It's a lifestyle. And, and this is where like I, somebody kind of explained this, this like argument to me is like, for instance, like, like look at freestyle, like more like freestyle, motocross freestylists, right? People literally put their life on the line all the fucking time, but then they live that life and nobody stops them from doing that. Right. But then you have right. people, I'm not gonna say any names, but you have people who fucking literally just like, they look at handling venomous like it's fucking not really spiritual but it they that's their thing like that's their fucking thing and you know you could you could say like a lot of people are doing it for for i guess clout nowadays but then yes you actually have some people who just really fucking love handling venomous i don't know i i don't it's it's i did the rush obviously there's obviously a crazy rush that comes behind it obviously um but what, i mean what, what what do you have to say to that like you know what i mean like how, how can you break that difference of like an extremist like somebody who rides fucking dirt bikes or goes off off cliffs fucking free base and shit like that or you know compared to someone who takes out cobras and rattlesnakes and shit just free handing you know okay so i guess i mean that that's a super loaded question obviously with with a lot with a lot of answers to it <laughs> uh but oh, no. um, hey, you know, you know when, when cody says it's loaded be ready okay so just <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be well behaved and not get too much on my high horse. But um, you know, as far as you know, like you know, dirt bike riders, professional dirt bike riders, extreme you know, extreme sports people, BMX people, snowboard. I love all that stuff, man. I'm a huge. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of regular sports, traditional sports. They just kind of bore me. I just don't. It's not my thing. No, it's a little like the you know. There's gonna be a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, no sports, but I. Yeah, it's just not my thing, but I, I love extreme sports and what people are able to do with, with their bodies, you know, gymnastics and stuff. When you see people doing double, triple backflips and, you know, BMX, like now, now the, the BMX, uh, you know, like it just keeps getting crazier and crazier. You know, they just, uh, somebody just landed a, a quadruple backflip on a BMX bike. Like I remember when Dave Mira did that, yeah. cause I was a big, big fan of BMX and BMX or you know, back in the day. Then I remember when when Dave Mira did a double backflip on a BMX bike, and that was just like you know it cannot get any crazier than a double backflip on a bike. And now we have a quad right. backflip, and then and then somebody doing a backflip quadruple tail whip. It's like, but but the thing is that yeah. it doesn't stop, and and that's an adrenaline rush. And, and but it's a, it's a, it's a different it's a different kind. Like, um, and and it that really only affects you if you're a bmx rider or you're a motocross person and you're putting your life on the line um doing that it only affects you it might affect your family members or people close to you if, if an accident happens but it's not probably going to change legislation on everybody else that rides motocross or bmx if, if you break your leg you know doing an extreme sport um, because people as a, as a general population you doing backflips on a BMX bike really doesn't affect them. If you're keeping cobras in in your house and you're doing YouTube videos of, of you playing with them and free handling them and doing risky stuff, and you know the soccer mom next door is watching these videos and they see uh, here's this person handling this highly lethal snake with their bare hands. Um, you know how safe is this? I've got kids. I don't have kids, but this is what they're thinking. I've got kids next door. What happens if one of these snakes gets out, bites them, gets out? You know, people are thinking this could affect more than just the person handling it. If somebody were to get bit by said venomous snake, um, where's that? And you know, if you're free handling, R.I.P. Dave Mara. Absolutely, Dave Mara is yeah. one of the greats. It was a real tragedy when when Super i heard about tragedy. about uh, yeah yeah he, he was a great guy too really really surprised at at that but um you know uh yeah, anti-venom if you're gonna free handle do you stock your own anti-venom or are you just doing reckless behavior you know in in the event of you're gonna get bit because you know you are you are more likely at risk of a bite if you're if you're holding a snake with your bare hands I don't care how much you know the snake. I don't care, you know, I know when it's upset. I know what whatever you don't, you know. I I've I've hooked out so many cobras I can't even see straight that didn't seem to have any apparent attitude problem at that time and smelled yeah. something that they liked on the snake hook and just decided to latch onto it and hang on for five minutes as I'm 
trying to shake them off the hook with that hook, poke them, poke them with another hook, spray them with some water, and they just have no interest in letting go of that snake hook, and they didn't seem like they were upset at all. So if you're, if you're holding them in your hands and you're letting them go through your hands and you're letting them do whatever, um, you know, you don't have any protective contact on whether or not that snake, if it decides to bite you without warning, there's no protection. Um, so, so why do it? You have animals that could put you on a ventilator, that you could mutilate you, uh, uh, cause amputations, put you six foot in the grave. Um, and, and, and for what? To, to just hold it in your hands? I don't know if it's as much of a adrenaline rush as doing a quadruple backflip on a BMX bike. For some, it might be, but it's, you know, so if, but if you get, if you're going to do that stuff, you need to be yeah. responsible and acquire your own antivenom. You can acquire your own antivenom. It's it, it's just a channel. You just got to do some paperwork and put in some effort. If you're going to spend thousands of dollars on caging and you're going to spend thousands of dollars on the animals themselves, why not spend a little extra and get the antivenom? If you get the uh, the IND number, which stands for investigational new drug, because antivenom is considered an investigation new drug by the FDA. So this, this comes from the FDA. And as a process, you have to get a, a doctor involved. That's going to be your doctor it signs off on it. We're very fortunate here in Florida. Dr. Ben Abo is our, our medical doctor. He's the medical director of Venom 1 and 2 here in Florida. Um, we, were, we had the privilege of meeting Ben Abo at the Venomous Herpetological Symposium in uh, Miami, Florida in 2018 and uh, hit it off. And um, he's our ER doctor on file and um, is, uh, has helped us get the IND to be able to bring in our own anti-serum so we could import our own anti-venom. Um, Kristen Wiley from Kentucky Reptile Zoo, uh, we're, we're, we're good friends and, and colleagues and Jim Harrison um, and, and Kristen, you know, they're, they're con when they do an importation of anti-venom, a lot of the times to bring the cost down, they're getting this zoo involved, they're gonna buy a pool of anti-venom this institution, this institution, and they, they have an additional license to get through, uh, get the antivenom through customs. So you need the FDA IND number to have your own antivenom and catalog it and all that stuff. Um, but there's an additional, there's some additional stuff you have to do to import it. And, 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 and Kentucky Reptile has that. And, and Kristen has offered like, uh, when, when you get antivenom, you could pull in with that to, it kept the cost down. And some of these exotic anti-venoms, you know, like monocled cobra, for example, um, I, I, I forgot what it was, but, um, you know, a, a, enough to, to get you going or save your life. Not too much, maybe about $400, uh, you know, in monocled cobra anti-venom. Now, now, don't necessarily quote me on that. I don't have the figures in front of me. I don't want to get, you know, eaten up by people that are looking at it. No, that's not, that's not true. But it, it's not the same as a hospital markup on antivenom when you're getting it right from the manufacturer legally, which is obtainable and respectable. If you're gonna keep these animals, do the, do, do the footwork to, to do that because a lot of these bites um, that people are taking, you know, it's like when, when somebody gets bit by their pet cobra, you know, it's usually late at night when zookeepers and other people who have antivenom that are gonna save these people's lives that don't have antivenom, are sleeping and you know what's going to happen is they go to the hospital they live in a state let's just say that they you know it could be legal but they've never dealt with a monocled cobra bite or a black mamba bite and uh you know they they'll they'll get in there they'll call poison control poison control will go through the anti-venom index which is which is on their thing and they'll go through a list of different zoos and institutions that have the anti-venom for the specific snake that did the biting and then they pick up the phone and they start calling and they start figuring and trying to get somebody on the phone, you know, probably some poor zookeeper in the middle of the night that uh, this person was bit, you know, and needs antivenom and zoos are under no obligation to give up their antivenom, but they usually do. Uh, and, and which ends up putting their keepers at risk because now they're depleting their stock to save somebody else who is being reckless. So if, if a zookeeper were to get bit after depleting their antivenom, doing a procedure or something, you know, just a, just a mistake, not free handling, using a hook, doing what, you know, sometimes accidents happen when you are trying to do everything right, you know? Um, but uh, so, so you can't, you know, Jim Harrison, you know, has, has a good saying where, you know, like working with venom is, 
Breakfast Animals is a, is a game of perfection and nobody's perfect. So, so there's all, you know, there are people that have been, you know, doing it their entire life and have never been bit. A lot of people say it's not a matter if you get bit, but when, and Jeff Fobb, who's uh, one of the, the captains at Miami Dade Venom One, who's also a good friend of ours uh, in the Venom interviews, he says it is a matter of if, because if you are you using the proper tools and you're doing what you're supposed to, it's not a matter of when. It doesn't have, you don't, when you start keeping venomous animals, you don't have to mentally prepare for the day that you're going to get bit. Because if you do everything right and you use the right tools and you keep common sense about you, you, you know, I know plenty of people that have been doing this for 20 plus years or longer that have not had a bite. And, um, you know, so you don't have to get bit to, to do this. But, uh, you know, it's... Um, right you know um but but stocking your own anti-venom is um if you're going to have these animals is is probably a smart thing to do so you don't have to rely on, because it's also your own life you know in your hands if you have anti-venom in a refrigerator ready to go and something happens and you get a bite and you know that you're on the way to the hospital right now with that anti-venom in a cooler by your side um you know you might not be the one driving yourself to the hospital, but you at least know that it's there. Um, right. You're probably, unless something unforeseen happens, I mean, venomous animals, I mean, a lot of these things are so insanely toxic and you can't predict what's going to happen once that venom enters your body. Everybody acts di reacts differently. Some people, uh, you know, so, so much more severe than others. Some people barely have a, a reaction to some of these bites and some people die in five minutes from anaphylactic shock. You never know which direction the, the snake bite is going to go. And when you have antivenom right there, epinephrine, uh, you know, get your, have your EpiPen just in case. If you have an allergic reaction to a venomous bite, that Epi is going to keep you in the game long enough uh, to receive medical attention. Um, it's important, you know, to, if, if, if you if you have antivenom with you, the, the people, if, if you're if you're getting an ambulance ride to the hospital and they're, they're mixing up the antivenom on the way to the hospital or they start an IV push in the ambulance and you're getting antivenom right away, you're going to have a very high likely. Again, everything is different, but you're going to have a much higher likelihood of a, a very positive recovery versus the person that was unprepared, had no idea where the antivenom was going to come from. And, the, you know, a lot of people don't think they're going to get bit. Nobody thinks they're going to get bit. I'm going to have no. these things. I'm going to do whatever. And until that happens, you, you're just not prepared for it. And then you go, and then all these things flash through your mind at once. What am I going to do? Where's the antivenom yeah. going to come oh, from? Who do I call? Do I, do, 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 I even, do I even have a venomous bite protocol? Does anybody even know who I am? <laughs> right? Like, you, you have phone numbers. Do you know, like, you, you know, what, what's going to happen? Is anybody going to miss me if I'm dead? Like, is anybody going to care? <laughs> exactly. Oh my so you, you got, you got, you, you know, it's like you got to have protocols on pro top of protocols and rehearse those things um, often. And so you know the process of it, if, it, if it comes down to that, what you're going to do um, in that event of a bite. We, we have a full bite protocol. We, we have, uh, we have antivenom, we have, um, you know, epinephrine and everybody is, is trained on what's going to happen. Um, if a bite takes place, you know, immediately we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to call our, our ER doctor and then call 911. Um, and, um, and prepare for the bite and then get right to our hospital, which is uh, our nearest major hospital, which is Shands in Gainesville. And, um, you know, our, our local EMS responders, the fire department right down the road, we're located in uh, Melrose, Florida. So we're just uh, in the historic Melrose, Florida, sorry, historic Melrose, Florida. Uh, we're right outside of Gainesville. And, um, you know, we, we know our local EMS responders, they know us, they've been to our facility, uh, they know what we keep, and, you know, we, you have to have that relationship with these people um, in the event something happens, because it's not just, you know, you're not just another person to them, or 
you know, them thinking what, like Black Mamba, Black Mamba, who's got a like it, it almost sounds not real to somebody who doesn't do snakes. Like it, it's like that sounds crazy. Yeah. And a lot of these emergency responders, they'll they'll jump into a burning building, you know, to save a person or get into a, a gun battle for a, for a bank robbery or, or something but won't go into a, a house or a facility if there's a, a snake in it, let alone a venomous snake. You know, a lot of these guys don't even care if it's a boa, you know, versus a cobra or a mamba or something. So it's good to, to get your EMS people and your local medical, you know, if, if you're keeping venomous, go to your local hospital, your major hospital that you would be at if a bite happened. Learn, figure out who the doctors would be who would be in charge of administering anti-venom and stuff introduce yourself. A lot of the times these guys are really interested in what you do anyway, because it's a really neat yeah. profession and animals. And even if they're af uh, afraid of them or they don't understand them, it's up to you as the keeper to uh, convey that to them in a way that's that's understandable and fascinating and let them know you. Uh, it's it's so important. I can't even stress that enough because you know th then you have all this stuff in order. So if a bite happens, you, you just make a couple phone calls. Your emergency, your emergency responders know who you are. Your doctor knows who you are. So you're coming in for a black mamba bite. You have your own, let's just say, let's, 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 let's just assume that we have our own anti-venom and, um, and, and you're coming in with your anti-venom and they know that you're coming um, like Carl Barden. Carl Barden is one of the shining, from, uh, he's the director of Med Talks and Venom Laboratories and the Reptile Discovery Center in Deland, Florida. Um, he was uh, one of my mentors coming up in the zoological field and still is to this day. He's always given me good tidbits of information. And like, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to consider him a really good friend. And, um, you know, never, never thought I would actually be able to do that because this is somebody that I, I spent a lot of time as a, as a, as a youngster looking up um, to, to Carl. But, uh, you know, he has definitely made such a relationship with his ER staff and emergency responders. Everybody knows them, um, you know, uh, un unfortunately in the venom uh, production uh, industry, you know, there are, there are bites that do happen. And uh, Carl has had a few bites and um, because of his relationship with the ER staff and the medical, uh, you know, emergency responders, um, they have been able to save his life on multiple occasions because of, of the fast acting um, uh, on, on, on everybody's behalf because everybody is already well versed in the drill if it were to happen. Um, and that's just really important and it's not hard to do. It just takes effort. It just takes effort and people just don't do it. You know, I, I don't know if it's because they just don't know to do it or they just, you know, they just don't think it's going to happen to them. But. Well, it seems to me like a lot of, I mean, not a lot, but it seems like for the most part, people like in state of Florida do have a venomous bite protocol. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying everybody does, but like, for instance, like, you know, the homie Joe, Joe Switoski shots at the homie Joe, right? He got, he got bit by a uh, fucking, what was that thing? Jesus Christ. The, the, like the really bad one Bush, from uh, Bush, Bushmaster. Uh, Bushmaster. Now, I believe that was the bite where he was in the hospital and the nurses or doctors were kind of like, yo, what do we fucking do? And he had to like yell at them to, yo, give me that fucking anti-venom right now. Like, cause I guess shit was going down, but like, it was like a fucked up situation, even when, with, even with the protocol, like even with, even though he knew what to do, he was still stuck in a situation where it could have went really, really bad, really, really quick. Um, and it's right. like, you really got to right. think of like, is this really worth, like, I, like, dude, you knew I had a speckled, I had a speck, I don't know if you did, but I had a speckled rattlesnake for a while, like, I loved the thing, mm -hmm. and I, and I would fucking free handle it, bro, I was addicted to fucking handling it, and, and I knew, I was like, dude, this isn't good, man, I was like, yeah, you know, this thing's calm, and whatever, and, you know, my wife fucking hated it, and literally, I knew I was playing with fire, and like how you said, how you see things just flashing, happening real quick, like, Luckily, it didn't take me getting bit to see that, but I started just like started flashing, thinking like, "What if?" Okay, like, "What if?" Like, I don't. Nobody knows I had a rattlesnake. Like, no, it's a secret. You know what I mean? And like, even though it's a native snake, it's still like I had no protocol. I have no fucking anti venom. You've been bit by a fucking Corallus machili, and and you know what I mean. That was no fucking walk in the park, right? I mean, that was that put you in the hospital for how long? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was uh, that was the uh, the only bite that uh, 
that that put me in ICU. I'm definitely not not proud of that bite. Of course, it was my fault, my mistake on a, a captive specimen. And um, yeah, it was like Pertalis Mitchelli pyrus or Mitchelli. Mi Technically, it would be Mitchelli. I, I got a I got a nice scientific lesson from one of my my Spanish colleagues in Costa Rica when we were out in Guatemala and we were talking scientific names and then they were making they were making fun of me for saying I at the end of it. So like Mitchelli, you'd say Cortalis oh, Mitchelli. Mitchelli virus, I've met. Oh, right? dude, I'm, this is why I don't even say scientific names because anytime I try to do something that I even rehearsed and practiced on Unfiltered, Stephen goes, hey, "No, that's wrong." And so I go, "Fucking this is stupid." Like, <laughs> I just, I don't even like, you know, I just, I try to just say the common name versus the scientific name because it is, I will tell you what, scientific name is something that you have to like, you have to say that name over and over and over and over again and then get corrected a few times before you really have that fucking name down, I feel like, dude. So whatever. Oh, 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 no, for sure. I mean, a lot of the scientific names that, that, that I'm pretty fluent with is, was, uh, uh, forged as an adolescent, looking at the scientific name very intensely, saying it very slowly, so many times before finally it was like, okay, that seems like the right way to say it, and then move <laughs> on. So, um, you know, uh, and, and some of them are really tough, man. Some of the spiders and tarantulas and and and, and invertebrates have some real tough scientific names to to, to spit out. But as as far as the the reptile stuff goes, you know, a lot of people tend to, if it has an I at the end of it, they like to say I, like price, price I, like for twin spot rattlesnakes or price I, um, or you, you, uh, you, you, I. But you and you and fours are the, are by far the coolest scientific name. Like the way you guys said it, it just, it sounded like you guys been saying it for years and years and years. And that's why I used to love. And like, I remember when I first started talking to force, he would only talk in scientific terms and it would kind of be like, yo, I don't even know what you're talking about right now. Like he would only spit scientific terms. And then I noticed when you were doing your stories really heavy, you only spoke scientific terms. And when I found out you guys were boys, I was like, that's fucking crazy. That is okay. That's, I don't know. It was nuts. Hey, who was better at the scientific term? You or him? Um, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to like talk highly about myself, but I mean, I've been I've been at this since I was a little kid, really priding 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 myself uh, on on a lot of these scientific that that terms. Too. So, I think he said that yeah, too. I so, think he admitted it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and and not just venomous species and stuff. I think I'm probably very well known for the venomous stuff and, and, and crocodilia. Um, but I'm, I'm a big fan of, of all, all reptiles and amphibians and just wildlife in general. But we, you know, we do a lot of work with other different, uh, reptile species, but, uh, the venomous stuff is, uh, you know, something that we're, you know, uh, kind of the claim to fame around here. But, uh, but yeah, you know, and as far as scientific terms go, when I'm dealing with the general public, I'm definitely making sure that I, uh, you know, I, I, I preference that with a common name or something that makes sense to the general public person. You know, I'm, right. not, I'm not saying scientific names to sound like a smarty pants, but, um, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm in uh, one of our montane areas uh, to behind me. I've got some yellow blotch palm vipers, uh, both Riacus Arifer. Uh, we, we were fortunate enough to go to Guatemala and see these in the wild and study their habitats and, and, and temperatures and, and, and kind of uh, tweak our husbandry methods accordingly. But they're yellow blotch palm viper. Now, they're both, both Riacus Arifer. Around here, we just, when we're, when we're talking to each other, we just say Arifer. If we're talking about, you know, it's like, hey, did you, did you check on that Arifer or whatever? Because saying Arifer, we know what we mean. And it's easier than saying yellow blotch palm viper. So in that case, the scientific term is a little bit quicker and more precise. But if I'm dealing with the general public, I'm probably going to say yellow blotched palm viper because it makes sense. It's a, it's a palm viper that has yellow blotches on it. So it makes sense. Both Riacus arifer doesn't make sense. It makes sense from zoological nomenclature or from a scientific point of view or herpetology. But to the general person, you know, it, it gets kind of boring and sciencey. But back to back to the the Mitchell eye, the you know talking about that Mitchell eye bite, it, you know it was that was that was the only bite that um, that put me in ICU, and uh, like I said, I'm not proud of it. Happened captive mistake, but I was in ICU for a week, and 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 35 
vials of crow fab for that bite for a real stupid mistake. And, you know, and, 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 I, and it was, it was a pretty placid individual that got me too. And, and usually it's those ones that you put a little bit too much faith in that you shouldn't and you cut corners that you shouldn't because you just know that animal. Right. And, um, you know, spec, that have been fired up and and you know that thing is going to pop you if you give it the opportunity mambas yeah. and cobras and taipans that i know are gonna you give them a millisecond and you're getting you're getting tagged you're gonna be less likely to make a you're, you're gonna be less likely to drop your guard and be complacent and around one of those animals animals because you know that animal means business but an animal that is very laid back that's highly lethal um, you know, a lot of the times those are the ones that get you crocodilians. People take a lot of liberties with crocodilians. I, I wouldn't take, um, you know, uh, and, and I always say with the crocodilian stuff there, at least with a lot of these venomous snakes, you got antivenom that's gonna, that's gonna probably, you know, give you a real positive outcome if you get it immediately and, and a healthy dose of it. There's no antivenom for a missing arm. If, uh, if a croc grabs it and and does a you know does a roll and takes it off, and if it's an animal that's real placid, you know those are animals that people take liberties with. I see people picking up big big alligators, big crocodiles, and and doing all of this stuff that I'm just like it's just not worth it to you know I don't have to I don't have to snuggle the animal. I don't have to be intimate with the animal. They're not they're not. I, I love these animals and I care for them as, as, as beautiful living animals and respect them more than anyone. Um, right. But I don't have a desire to pick these things up with my, you know, yeah, I'll do tailing, you know, grab, grab a cobra by the tail, put it in a holding can or whatever, you know, if, if done properly and with somebody that, that knows what they're, they're doing and how to do it. Um, yeah, that, that's a fairly, um, fairly acceptable handling technique, but there is risk. There is risk. If you're grabbing a cobra, or something by the tail, there's always a risk that the animal's gonna flip up and, and, and grab your hand before you have a chance to let it go. Um, you know, two hooks are better. Uh, you know, keeping not you know, I've I've tailed mambas throughout the years and now I rarely get a mamba by the tail unless I have to because I, I get them on two hooks and they respond so well on two hooks and they're so calm. Well, I wouldn't say calm, but 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 they are calmer and they you know the second oh, wow. you grab them and touch them they don't like to be touched they they're very jumpy and nervous animals and the second you start touching them you start escalating the situation and the goal of working mambas is to keep them as calm as you can and get them to whatever you need to get them as fast as you can as keeping them as calm as you can so if you're going from an enclosure to a holding can do it as smooth and calm as you can without getting the animal fired up and getting them back in is usually easier than getting them out because half the time they just don't want to come out of the enclosure. So you're fighting with them trying to get them out. You know, all these people that say, oh, mambas chase you and forest cobras chase you and all that stuff. It's a bunch of BS. I, I, I mean, people, yeah, yeah, a cobra or a mamba can advance on you a little bit to get you out of their way if they're fired up and mad, but they're not going to chase you. Chasing is like, it's chasing you down a hallway and you turn a corner and make a left and the, the snake takes a left too. It keeps going after you. You know, That's usually... Usually once, you, once you're out of their way, they're going a different way. You know, I've been advanced on by King Cobras and Black Mambas because I'm in, I'm in their space and, and they do a lunge. And the second I get out of their way, they take off the opposite direction. They're just trying to get away from you and you're preventing their escape. So they're going to defend themselves. And something like a Mamba with the athletic abilities that a Mamba has is just very bite capable and it's a very dangerous animal to be in close proximity to so it really takes a lot of concentration and experience and level headedness i think working mambas is um you know it's just you you have to have a level head and when they start firing up and they start getting wiry you got to stay calm and you have to keep that rational train of thought because if you start speeding up your train of thought and trying to match that snake is the speed or movements or whatever all you're going to do is get that animal more fired up react more defensively and it's just going to be a worst case scenario for you and um you know it's so so two hooks uh, over the years i've really enjoyed doing two hooks on a lot of things because you're suspending the animal at two points of its body you're not just holding it by the tail and letting the vertebrae hang which is obviously really bad for heavy-bodied snakes 
Um, you know, two hooks is really good. You, you, you know, and if you could get good with two hooks, you're, you're being very, very safe. Um, and the animals certainly respond better to it. Um, and, and, you know, if you got to touch them, you get them into a tube or something, but I, I just never had the desire to pick these animals up just to touch them and, and, and feel them, you know, it's like, it's just not, it's not something that I think about. I love looking at them. I love the appreciation of the animals. I love seeing them in their exhibits, natural exhibits, uh, exhibiting natural behaviors and just being left alone. A lot of our enclosures are done up naturalistically where we could work around the animals half the time, depending on the species. Sometimes the animal has to be removed if it's a big mamba or something in a feeding response that we have shift boxes and stuff that we use as a tool, but we don't exclusively shift. Sometimes they don't want to shift and you got to get them out to clean or give water or something. And you just, you got to know how to handle them to get them out of there. But if, but if they're in a shift, it's yeah. convenient and we'll shut the shift door, change a water bo uh, bowl or, or what have you, and then get right back to it. But if, if we got to handle them, we will. Um, but uh, a lot of our enclosures are set up to where we could just work around them and grab water dishes out with forceps or we have bioactive setups where we have to do minimal cleaning. Uh, you know, we still do maintenance in those enclosures. We don't just set them and forget them and just let, let, let you know, nastiness build up. But a good, well-ran bioactive setup is going to really aid you in husbandry. And it's a, it's a, it's a significant up cost in the beginning. And it's a lot of, you got to do a lot of research. And you really have to understand how that system works to do it right for the species that you're doing it. But, but when, you, when you can get that dialed in, um, they're actually a lot less maintenance than something that's like in a rack or in an enclosure that has paper or aspen or something where you have to cut, you remove that animal to clean them all the time and stuff. So we're, we're working around our animals a lot without even having to harass them. Some of our palm vipers, we haven't had to remove out of their enclosures uh, for years. And we've been breeding them in those enclosures for years. Uh, the uh, the, the, the uh, two-line forest pit viper that is on the little thumbnail of this um, uh, of this interview. There you go. We call him Little Uno. He was our first one produced, the two-line forest pit viper, uh, so now nice. currently recognized as both rops by lineatus. They were they were formerly Bothriopsis by lineata, um, but but they have been reclassified to uh, both rops by lineatus. Uh, I don't necessarily really agree with the reclassification, but uh, that that's for a different rant. But uh, that animal, we call him Uno because the female, she dropped just Uno. It was just him, just one. No stillborns, no nothing. It was just him. And it was a random, um, it was just a random thing. I mean, we, we, we paired him and we knew that they locked up and we were expecting some babies, but it was just him. And we ultrasound the female for fear that she might be uh, bound up with more babies. But she was fine. And um, she has produced three of them other litter or four other litter sets then um and you know went from one one year to uh man what was it it was like uh maybe god i can't remember but i think the last year we got 16 babies on the on the second go around and then this year we got two litters from her one in february of seven babies perfect babies no stillborns and then just recently in October, uh, we got another litter of 11 babies from this same female and not trying to produce them, but we have a pair uh, house together in a bioactive natural planted enclosure. And uh, they just do their thing. I don't see the male for months. I don't see him for months. He's tucked up in pork tubes and, and vegetation. And sometimes I'm like, man, I hope he's still alive, but he knows the routine. Because when he's hungry, I'll come and sit up in the front and then I'll, you know, tongue feed him a, you know, a frozen thawed mouse. And then he goes and hides for three months, comes back out, breeds the female, takes a meal, goes and hides for another three months. And I don't see him. And, uh, you know, so we just extract the babies when we see him. And we actually just put that video up on the Patreon, the last the last litter of Bilineata babies that we got from her. We have that on the Patreon. And that was a pretty cool video. Um, and the outtakes are pretty funny as well, but, um, th those are, those are phenomenal species and not commonly kept in, in collections, zoological or, um, or private and, and very, very infrequently, um, produced. So 
and, and we're not even trying. It's effortless for us. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, I, I have some amazing gift. I just set these up very natural. We've got UV in there. We, we keep the temps, you know, not super hot. These animals are in, in, in pretty dense rainforest. You know, we keep them in the mid 70s to low 80s and we don't get them too hot. And we, we give them UV and uh, we just let them do their thing. You know, they cycle with the seasons and we're not really trying too hard. We're, we're, we're just providing a good environment and making sure the animals are healthy and they're just doing what comes naturally to them. If, if you got a good, healthy, um, happy, you know, stress-free animal, semi-stress-free, because there's always stressors in captivity, but um, a well acclimated, you know, animal is, is probably going to produce for you. Um, quick question, Cody. And I want to not really change directions because I just want to keep I want to keep on the topic for handling right now because I want to introduce a new okay. animal, new animal that I got recently. His name's Rock Steady. Mm -hmm. I just want to know how to handle him. Okay, I want to know like the proper way to handle him. Okay, so cool ass beaded lizard that I got gifted from my homie Miguel. Um, I, you know, I, I just, I watch from him afar. I don't fuck with him, but I, I, I want to know if that day does come where I have to handle him. How should I handle this guy? So there's a couple of different um, handling techniques that you could use for beaded lizards. And, you know, surprisingly, they're an animal that, that double hooks very well. So if you could get, uh, you know, snake hooks that are the size of the animal, right? It's a neonate now, uh, in the photo right that that's a neonate that you got yeah he's he's small he's the, he's the well I, I don't want to say small but he's you know he's a juvie you know yeah yeah and i mean you could hook them up until they're adults but you know a lot of people like to you know you see a lot of careless handling with heloderma you see a lot of people just holding them in their hands and letting them walk through there and they they don't yeah, take them that. very seriously yeah 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 and, and, and they're definitely an animal that uh, deserves to be taken seriously. I, uh, you've, been, you've been bit uh, by one, right? I've actually had the uh, the pleasure and misfortune of being bit by a neonate beaded oh, lizard um, on, a on, on a release. I, I had him right above the shoulders, right behind the head. And, has, and I was going through um, a colony of babies that were produced. And I'd go from a, a, a pin with a snake hook to a grab and do a and do a holding container to a pen and then release and then release the pen. So very safe. You're very safe, other than you have your hands on the animal. Um, but uh, towards the end of this group of baby beaded lizards, I started kind of speeding up and kind of breezing through it and being a little careless as most of these bites happen. Um, and the animal that I was holding it had its mouth gaped, it obviously wasn't happy. Um, and it had its um, its rear foot attached to my wrist, and they they have a semi prehensile tail. So that Cody, tail Cody, 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 I'm gonna use, Cody, I'm gonna use the restroom. I've heard this story three times, so just just keep talking, kids. I I have to take a piss. <laughs> all right, got gotcha, you, got gotcha. you. Um, all right, everyone. So here we are. Um, but uh, so the the animal was uh, wrapped around my wrist with its tail was like so half you know, wrapped around the wrist and I set it down. And instead of going from a pin back to a pin and a release and taking the, the pin off, I, um, I just put my hand, you know, put it in the holding container and did the whole pull away real fast. And, um, you know, usually that works. It's worked, um, you know, a bunch of times before, but doesn't mean that uh, there's not uh, room for, for mistake. Um, and uh, the animal its mouth was already open uh ready to go and i yanked it back with me because it was attached to my wrist and it, it was a you know a, a, a immediate turn chomp bit me with half of its of, of its mouth it wasn't a full bite and man that's all it took it was excruciatingly painful right off the bat heloderma venom is um you know primarily used for defense not prey capture as in venomous snakes venomous snakes are you know their their lethal venom is designed for prey capture and the um you know the negative effects that you're gonna get from from those bites as a human are just side effects because you're a bigger prey item or you're a bigger you're a bigger animal than a mouse or something but for a beaded lizard or a gila monster 
their venom is, uh, you know, they're, they're a lizard that's not all that fast and, and isn't as well equipped from getting away from potential predators as, let's say, like a spiny lizard or something like that. So their venom is for prey capture or for, for, for defense, not for prey capture. So it's designed to be intense and hurt and a lot of pain. Um, so if a coyote or something grabs a Gila monster or a beaded lizard and gets bit, they're, they're you know, probably not going to die from it, but they're probably going to think twice the next time they, they see one of those animals. So the second that that lizard bit me, it was intense pain. Um, yeah, the, what I, I did is I immediately put it back on all fours and um, took a snake hook and tapped the back of its tail and foot because I knew it was going to just immediately turn to swing at whatever was agitating it from the back because babies are very whippy and very nervous. A big adult may be more likely to to clamp on and, and hold on. So I had I had only maybe a few seconds of that animal on my uh, thumb, half bite, probably the size of the one that MJ just showed. And anybody who tells you that they need to chew on you to envenomate you is, uh, is, is BS. And they've either never been bit or they just, they just don't know or, or they, were, they were lucky if they, they had been bit. But the, more, the longer that they hang on, the more venom they're gonna introduce into a bite um, because their, their venom delivery, they've got their venom glands on the lower jaw and you know they don't have hypodermic type needles like cobras and, and and vipers and stuff do so when they bite that venom pools up in the gum lines and gets uh massaged into the bite as the animal clenches down um for a larger specimen they are more likely to hang on and hold on everybody has their recipes oh you put a rubbing alcohol on them or you you know do this or that um, I think the best thing that you could do, and I'm not giving a, a bite advice or anything like that. I'm just explaining what I would do if I had an adult beaded lizard or a Gila monster bite. I would release that animal from being held by me, and I would set that animal on all fours and maybe tickle its backside with a hook or grab the tail or whatever, because it's going to probably go after that agitation behind it. Now it might clamp down a little harder for a couple seconds until it does that. But a lot of people that I've seen that get bit by bigger animals, they, they hold the animal while the animal's biting them. And the animal continues to hold and not let go because you're already holding the animal and they already feel like they're, um, they're, they're captured. So they're giving you, they're holding on and they're biting harder and they're giving more venom in hopes that you're gonna let them go so if you keep holding them you're probably going to keep getting bit um if you let them go they're, they're, they want to get away they don't want to be biting you you put them in the situation for them to bite you they didn't want to do that um so if you let them go they're probably going to try to get away from you once they have an opportunity to do that um oh, but uh, yeah beaded lizard bites are painful um and people definitely take a lot more now my bite i was being i was being relatively safe towards the end i got a little little careless um but i was still you know trying to be safe i i had it hooked to my wrist with its foot and pulled it back and i was just you know i i could have waited a little longer to make sure all fours were back in the container to, to let it go and pull my hand away but i just oh, you know did God. that and it happened um but it, but it was an eye opener and um i don't recommend it uh but i do see a lot of people doing really dumb stuff with heloderma you know holding them on their shoulders and said oh they're big and, and listen they can be they can be very uh you know almost almost deceptively passive animals but it, they're a venomous animal they're not a bearded dragon and they and they shouldn't be treated like one um and it, you're you're setting yourself up for a real painful bite and although not typically lethal if you have a pre-existing health condition or there's some other medical reason you never know how your body is going to react. People buy, die of bee stings because they're hypersensitive to the to the bee venom. So um, I, I just think it's not really worth it. And have you seen the movie? Experience. You, seen my, you seen the movie My Girl? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Macaulay, Macaulay Culkin dies from bee stings. So I'm just backing you up on that. Yeah, I mean, it just like it it hurts, and I don't recommend it. So. Keeping your fingers out of uh, venomous animal's mouth is a good thing. But as far as your handling of, of that beaded lizard, 
you could do two hooks and you could get them right under the front legs and right under the back legs and you could lift them up and you would be surprised at how well those animals double hook. They double hook incredibly well. Then it's kind of fun to hook a lizard. You know, you don't think about hooking a venomous lizard, but they do act and it's a little less stress free for them as a baby. They're super whippy and defensive and they want to bite. And you know what's going to make them want to bite even more? When you bam and pin them to the ground and behind the head and they're flailing yeah. around or you pin them and you do it, you're just pissing them off for no due reason. An animal that small, you don't need to grab to pick up to move them. You could, and a lot of times with our little baby hemoderma, you know, I might even do it with one hook, but I'll have another hook handy. But sometimes they, they, they get their arms and they, I got to, I got to. Yeah, I, sure. I would like to see what kind of hooks you're talking about here. That'd be great. I, I got I got a hook right here, you know. Oh. So their little their little their, their little arms are gonna hang right above the hook there. And sometimes you can just lift them up and they just kind of do a little pull up and go in go into the next enclosure. But if you get them at the front legs and then you get the other hook behind the rear legs, you could just bloop from one container to the other. And man, they, they respond to, to that so well, and it's so easy to double hook. You don't even have to put your hands on them. Um, and as they get bigger, you know, if you have to do that, I would wear gloves or some sort of protection um, if you're going to do that. I wouldn't let them casually walk through your hands because beaded lizards and Gila monsters uh, are, are easily surprised and spooked. They do a real quick, like, sideways swing yeah. and very yeah they're yeah quick. they're very they're very they're oh very, my God. yeah they're, they're yeah this, this, yep. this thing and makes me this thing makes me scared from like two feet away when it like just jerks its body and it goes and it hisses and i'm like oh my god this whole's fucking just beasty like oh i don't know it, but I, I like that kind of excitement but i'm not gonna handle it don't get me wrong. i definitely don't ever want a fucking beaded lizard bite in my life are you kidding me like I, I mean, from what I remember, you told me that was no, it was no fucking fun experience. Like you, you, your body went through hell for a couple of days, right? Oh, it was about a week of, of uh, pretty significant pain and swelling, and every oh, time your heart beat, you know, your hand was throb, but at the same time, and you know, just imagine every time your heart beats, uh, slam your hand in a car door if you've ever done that, and that, that oh, pretty much yeah. sums up a beetle lizard bite. And, and I mean, and I mean it too. It's it's. Venom is an incredible thing, and it's amazing what these little animals, you know, have developed and, and what they can do. And they really deserve a lot of respect. And I feel like a lot of people disrespect the, the, the serious nature of venomous animals. And it's just not an animal that you play with. You know, it's an animal that, that you respect and you could exhibit and look, you know, and you do. We have to handle our animals, obviously, for the day to day maintenance and stuff like that. You know, we have to put our animals, we, uh, hands on our animals. We know what they feel like. But it's not something that we have, you know, like, you know, we don't just have to like play with the beaded lizards because we have this bond or relationship with them. You know, some people feel that way. Some people feel that they do. And some of these people that, you know, going back to the free handling thing and and, um, you know, dirt bike riding and, 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 and you know, uh, the adrenaline rush and all that stuff and people feeling like they have to um they have to do that because it's, you know, like they have that connection with the animal. If they have the connection with the animal, which, which the animal, I, I, I can reassure you that the animal does not have the same connection with you. Um, but that, 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 is, that is, yeah, that is just on your end. Whatever connection is that that animal doesn't know why it's being suspended in air. They don't know why there's some person bobbling their head in front of them you know, or doing, doing goofy stuff to get a rise out of a cobra. Um, they don't understand that these animals are, are, they're, they're, they're meant to do what they're supposed to do. And it's, and I promise uh, being handled by a, a, a homo sapien is not a normal natural thing for these animals that are very solitary. And the only other thing that, that touches them where it's not necessarily a predator or something that they need to get defensive about is a mate. You know, the only other thing that usually touches these animals that's that's not a negative for them in the wild is a mate. Anything else that touches any of these animals, whether it's a bearded dragon or a king cobra, it's not a natural thing for these animals. And and certainly reptiles don't don't you know have that same 
connection with with people as people may think that now there, there are certainly animals that are very intelligent monitor lizards are very intelligent and, and, and can respond to their keepers crocodilians are incredibly intelligent and respond to keepers and and stuff like that and, and you know who knows they they they, they may they, there may be something there but i just don't know if it's necessarily what we we interpret as what their train of thought is I try to be very vague on those kind of things because I don't know what they're thinking. You know, it's like they probably just think I'm a predator uh, that also brings them food, <laughs> you know, and and stuff like that. But if it really is the connection with the animals, um, why post it? If it's not about, if it, you know, we've been saying if it's not about your ego, there's no real need to post it online. If it's not about showing off and it's not about you know, if it's really about a sincere, true interest of the animal, um, you don't need to advertise that on social media. There's a man, there is a lot of stuff in the, you know, the law enforcement and all these fish and wildlife um, agencies, whether it's Florida, which is incredibly strict. Um, and a lot of these other places, these guys are, they're paying attention to this. And I know for a fact, a lot of zoological professionals use these videos of free handling as training videos for staff on what not to do with venomous animals or how venomous reptiles are not to be handled. So, so there is one good thing that the free handling thing has done, and that is uh, made great informative tools for professionals to use on the non-appropriate ways of handling these animals. Um, and, but, but other, but other than that, um, there's just, you know, like, like state agencies and everybody says, oh, there's no laws that have been attributed to free handling. Okay. And let's preference that with yet. Yeah, there's no laws that have been, uh, attributed with free handling yet. Maybe there is somewhere, but you know was was there always a law against texting and driving you know at one point there was no cell phones to be able to text and drive or you know watch something on youtube or you know on facebook from your phone so it wasn't a problem before now there's so much of that where people can just you know do anything from their phone that they're distracted from driving and there's been enough accidents and and accidents is that a word accidents <laughs> <laughs> there's been enough there's been enough incidences with uh with that <laughs> to where now there's there's laws everywhere and you know in 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 California are you even allowed to be like you you got to be hands free calling and all kinds of stuff right yeah, if you're yep, going to be on your phone yep so so you're you're telling me that you know somebody recklessly handling a lethally venomous animal um, is not something that 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 is on uh, a state regulatory agency's mind. I mean, these guys are paid to create legislation. You know, the soccer mom that watched the YouTube video of somebody free handling a cobra calls your state agency and says, um, you know, who is this? Oh, they have a permit. How do they have a permit? Yeah, like, and, and then, you know, there's an incident with that cobra or it gets out or it bites somebody um, or it bites the person and then gets out. And then, you know, it, it's not a real hard thing for a lawmaker to make that decision. Everybody in the reptile industry is so, um, you know, like I love U.S. Arc. Uh, Phil Goss is a, is a good friend of ours and he's helped us out a lot with our own uh state regulations on st and stuff with fish and wildlife here uh it's a phenomenal group and 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 much needed but everybody wants to keep their boas and their pythons and their their tegus and their iguanas and all of this stuff these are animals that are harmless okay look at all the laws and bans that 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 states want to do on harmless animals that are not a threat to a general public person. Now let's start talking about animals that can kill you potentially within 30 minutes of a bad bite. Now, how hard is that to justify to a non-snake loving person um, in a court saying, 
hey, why should why should regular people that are not in zoos keep a cobra in their house and recklessly handle it with their bare hands? Oh, let's create a law that says we're going to completely outlaw it because that would make sense to a normal person. Even if you do everything right, what, what we're doing, having anti-venom protocols, having all this stuff, we've, we've got people in our area and neighbors to us that, um, that are big fans of what we're doing. We have neighbors that have kids that love, that love us, that love what we're doing. They love the educational aspect. And then we've got neighbors that are completely snake phobic. You're not going to change their mind. And no matter what comments, you could say, I've got anti-venom and I've got this and I've got that. And a snake is a snake to them, and 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 they don't they don't want you here now. Now, if you add like your reckless handling and and being a sensationalistic, you know, uh, adrenaline junkie or something, you're gonna make that person, you know, at least the snake, not the person that doesn't love snakes and is iffy about venomous animals. If you if you tell them, listen, we we have our. Uh, emergency doctor on standby we're like this we know all of our local ems responders um they know what we're doing what we have and all of our animals are contained we have multiple fish and wildlife inspections here uh, a year to make sure our caging our inventory um, our protocols our natural because we have to have natural disaster plans in florida where um you know we're uh like in the event of a hurricane or whatever, that it's like a one, two, three process of what we do to contain animals and, and what we're going to do pre-event, event and post-event after a hurricane and all of this stuff. So you can present this to a person that doesn't like snakes and, um, you know, and, and they're going to feel a little bit better about it. They're going to feel, but they're still not going to, you know, you're probably not going to, you know, uh, you can't save them all kind of thing. But responsible handling goes a long way. You have, un, 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 fortunately or unfortunately, or however you want to look at it, the general, like, I don't have to impress reptile people or convince you as a reptile person to, that you to, to love or appreciate venomous animals or whatever, or to understand them, because you already do. But for a general public person, they don't understand, you know, a lot of times they just don't understand your fascination with these animals. And no matter what logic you're going to throw at them, they just can't wrap around why somebody would want to keep or work with a venomous snake. And, or snake and, or and you have to. General. Or a snake in general. Remember, I think you told, yeah, you told me, you told me that general population is afraid of snakes. Like if we leave it to the general populations, they would not want us to have snakes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If you, if you went around and you asked a hundred of your neighbors, um, you know, Hey, I've got, I've got a hundred venomous snakes and, and, uh, how do you, you know, I handle them with snake hooks and I've got anti-venom and I've got this, how do you feel about it? You know, you're, you're yep. probably not going to have a bunch of people that are, are, are very supportive of that, you know? Um, right. Regardless. It, it's unfortunate because they, they are so amazing and, and you have to be able to convey that to people, but, um, you know, we have to, as an industry, I, 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 I also reference Jim Harrison's, uh, he has another quote that I love is that, um, you know, we have to police ourselves because if we don't police ourselves, somebody else is going to police us for us. And we don't want that. You don't want somebody else to police you. You don't want the state agencies to police you because you're not going to get what you want. If, if we police ourselves, we're going to get what we want. If somebody else is going to police us, we're not going to get what we want. And, and we have to be smarter because this isn't smart. It's the way that a lot of these guys are conducting themselves on social media. It, you know, it gets a lot of empty calorie followers. You, you, you might, you might get a million subscribers but they're empty calories. They're empty. They're Twinkie calories. You know, it's like I, like I want the respect of the zoological professionals, directors, curators, uh, scientific researchers, um, you know, doctors, and 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 these, you know, these are um, a, a lot of people that I'm lucky to be associated with and, and call friends. And you know, I, I take I take that following of professionals over 2 million subscribers of airheads that, um, you know, just, just want to see a quick thrill. 
um, you know, but it's, uh, it's, it's a problem and it's gonna, it's gonna be to the point where, um, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, it's happening all over the place. Look at all the new regulations that have, uh, you, I, I remember when HR 669, uh, you know, for the, the Python bill back in the day, Larry and BT on Reptile Radio heavily, you know, promoting that on writing your letters and then doing all that, you know, and then just after that, it was just year after year, another bill, another bill, another state, something stupid, something ridiculous is trying to sneak another bill in there. Like, was it always like that? Or, or is it something that's, that's, that now these politicians are paying more attention to because there's a lot more reckless behavior online where people are posting dumb YouTube videos and, 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 and dumb Instagram stuff and, and Facebook and whatever. And these guys, there are people in these agencies, they are paid as investigators to watch this stuff and come up with legislation. Let's not give them any more ammo. They already have a ton. They already have a ton. And, you know, like, th it, like be less selfish. The people that are doing this, it's about them and it's about their ego and it's about being selfish. If they were being selfless, they wouldn't do that. Because if you look at the bigger picture, um, you, you know, you've got so many people that are doing it properly that this is their life, that they've worked decades to do this, and they're very responsible. They're going to face stricter regulations or outright bans because of somebody else being responsible. They never even had a mishap or a bite or, or an escape, and now they're paying the price for somebody else's mistake. It's um, it's it's a real thing, and um, you know, it's it's only going to get worse from here. And I don't see it getting better. I think you know, new people, you know. If, if, if one person drops off that does this kind of reckless free handling, another person's going to take their place and, and you can't, you can't stop them all. So, I mean, you really can't man. And like, even if you take away the ones that have the biggest platforms, like it's still going to happen, man. That's what I'm saying. Like it's, I don't, I don't think the big platforms help, but it's not going to stop. Like the, the Instagram accounts aren't going to stop. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know if it's because the big platforms already le like led that kind of example, but I don't think that's that. I mean, at the end of the day, this thing, holding venom is free handling. It's always been a fucking thing. Like people have done it. And what's unfortunate is people are doing it for the wrong reasons. Like you just explained and it kind of spoiled and ruined it. I mean, just how like drugs coming in here wasn't a big thing until people abused it and started making meth and crack. And then it's like, fuck, no more drugs can be fucking brought in here now. I don't know. Just, that's just a small example. But um, either way. Yeah. You way know, and, I, I, and I don't know. If, and, I, and I wouldn't necessarily say that there was ever a right reason or acceptable reason to, to pick up these things with your bare hands. I mean, think about it like. You know, just, the evolution of cave, uh, the evolution of caveman, right? Like at some point you pick up the snake and it bites you and, and the caveman dies and they go, oh, well, like we probably shouldn't, you know, pick up snakes to begin with. But, oh, look, here's a stick. Here's a stick that if I pick the snake up with the stick and it safe. bites the stick, I don't die. You know, oh, here's a tool. Why don't we evolve a little, little bit and use some tools to keep our fingers out of the snake's mouth? It's not that hard. Um, yep. You know, set a better example for other people. Now, a lot of these guys in the, in the beginning of their videos, they'll, they'll have something like, we're, like I'm a professional and only, and only associate myself with other professionals. Well, just because you might have a permit or something doesn't necessarily make you a professional. It's what you do and how you act as a professional. Are you conducting yourself professional? When you say that you're, you only associate with other professionals and they're also playing with cobras in their hand and doing reckless BS with the animals, I wouldn't call those people professionals. Do you see zoological facilities doing that? When you go to San Diego Zoo or Toledo Zoo or one of these, these major, any of these zoos, they have all these safety protocols and hooks. And it's not because they're people just, they, they're not good enough to handle the animals with their bare hands. These are lethal animals that need to be taken seriously. And there are like very, there are very severe consequences to abide from these animals professionals don't handle those animals like that they just don't and so to call yourself a professional when you do that kind of stuff you're an amateur i've said that all the time if you free handle venomous animals you're an amateur i don't care how much you know the animal or how much experience you have it's a mindset you need 
to grow out of that. You're still a kid. You know, I, I've, I've done some reckless handling behaviors in my day. I, I'm guilty of it too, but I never sensationalized anything on social media or anything like that. You live, you learn, you get better, you know, you do dumb things and, and um, you know, you, you, you absolutely have to learn from those things. But like, if you, if you pick up these animals with your hands, regardless of how much you think, you know, the animal's behavior, you're an amateur. You have to grow You have to grow that professional mindset. Professionals do not free handle. They do not do that. That's an amateur thing. Talk to anybody who runs a professional zoological facility with venomous animals and talk to them about their opinion on free handling. They're all going to say the same thing. And it, it, it's reckless. It's going to put other people in a bad spot and it's going to create more laws eventually. And it's going to take freedoms. Um, you know, one of the reasons uh, what else we, we, you want to know what else is doing too, Cody? I don't mean to cut you off, bro, but you want to know what else that it's doing no, too you, is it, it's showing a poor example how someone could just call themselves a professional when, like, you know, like you said, like the zoological side, like, you know, actual professional, like, ism at its finest. You know what I mean? Where, and no disrespect to anyone who, like, calls himself a professional because how much they handled, it's just not the same level of professionalism like what you're trying to explain it, basically. Yeah. Sure. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, no, I mean, that, that's about it on the high horse. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go run off camera real quick, but I'll be right back. Go ahead. Um, I'm kind of parked. Yeah. I need, I need, I need a beverage. Oh, yeah. So I will be back. So you can right. fill I some got, dead air time. Yep. I got the next topic ready to go. So when you get back, get ready. Cody Bartolini just went ahead and dropped some heat. Got that out of the way. Venomous talk. I do appreciate Cody for being here, you know, because, you know, you got to understand Cody won't associate himself with people who straight free handle. I'm not a free handler. Don't get me wrong. I'm just, I'm just a pod, I'm a podcast uh, host. So I, I just bring people on. But at the end of the day, I'm only here to hear people that I respect in this hobby, in this game, whatever the fuck industry. And uh, that's it, man. And, and uh, Cody's, like I said, since day one. I hear Cody's passion, and I know it comes from experience. It comes from people he's been mentored by. And, you know, experience is the best teacher, man, especially when you have, like, the zoological side and, like, you actually seen it and worked for it in yourself and, and whatnot, and he's back. So I'm glad we talked about that, um, Cody, and I'm sure we could keep talking and talking and talking about it, but we have a, a next big topic that I want to bring up. Um because if it's one thing I learned that Forrest would always say, you know, on his rambles, and I used to hate him for saying this because I was like, no, you're lying, but everything has nidovirus. He told me my whole collection has yeah. nidovirus. <laughs> He's like, your whole collection has nidovirus. You know that, right? I was like, shut the fuck up. No, it doesn't. And he would just go on like how people don't see how they're just it's just it's just under people's nose and they don't give a fuck they don't want to look down and it's right there you know what i mean um so i i understand i, I had a couple people uh, because like listen at the end of the day man you fucking had some beautiful chondros man i mean i don't know i mean your, your chondros were just fucking ridiculous I, I i keep forgetting on like wow this fucking guy produced some amazing amazing fucking looking chondros in his time um and now you don't work with any chondros anymore is that correct no, that's actually not correct. We we do oh. um, we do have okay. a, a small group of of, of chondros. Um, we will be rebuilding our chondro collection. Oh, that's Ooh. a real nice one. That's a that, we still have the male the sire to that animal. That's a a dream lemon blue line animal with some bioc influence oh in there, God. and that turned into a real extraordinary animal. Yeah, that. Let's talk about the uh, w let's talk about the beginning of the chondro uh, stage of what your collection and, and, and what what kind of effect nidovirus had on it, if you don't mind. Okay, um, you know the, the 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 quick and dirty of it is uh, got into chondros with Forrest at the same time when when Forrest and I actually first met. Um, we met in a in a random. Um, flea market, uh, a reptile shop called the snake shop. It was a pretty cool little place. And uh, I knew the owner and I was hanging out there and I, uh, knew Terry Phillip, the curator of reptile gardens in, in South Dakota. Um, and I had met him for the first time at the international herpetological symposium in San Antonio, Florida in 2006. Um, funny story. I got the shirt off of his back during an auction when, uh, 
uh, we we did this uh, little plan for Terry because I like the Red Hall Gardens T-shirt um, that that he was wearing, and I was talking to Kim Foos, Ken's wife at the time, and I said uh, I said we need to get that shirt from Terry, and she's like I got it. So um, you know during the auction. Ken and 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 uh, Ken stood up. Terry and Bob Ashley's there, you know, and and um, I think uh, I'm not sure if Ken was the vice president of IHS at the time, and Bob Ashley was the president, or I, I think that might might have been it, but it might have been Ken was, was the president. I know Ken at one point was the the president of of IHS, but it was Bob Ashley and and, and him, you know, and uh, and stood up Terry with the Reptile Gardens T-shirt. Today we got. Our, uh, next next item up for a bid is this uh, beautiful Reptile Gardens T-shirt modeled by Terry Phillip, and it was a bidding war between you know Kim and I, you know, because whoever was going to win, I was going to get the shirt, you know. So so I got the Reptile Gardens T-shirt, and Terry and I hit it off, and he's another mentor and a friend. Yeah. And uh, so I was I was wearing that T-shirt in the snake shop, and I was looking at some condros. And, uh, and Forrest just, you know, he had moved down from, uh, Reno, Nevada, you know, him and Desiree grew up in, in South Dakota, but, and they, and they've, they've moved all over the place, but they moved to Reno, Nevada for, which is Northern Nevada, um, for, for some work. And then that work in timeshare brought Forrest down to Las Vegas, where Desiree went to UNLV, uh, to get her degree. And uh, so they were, they were in Vegas and Forrest was, you know, into reptiles and not as heavy as he was, um, you know, at the time where everybody knows the forest that they know today, but uh, you know, he knew Terry growing up in, in South Dakota and reptile gardens was a frequent stomping ground for, for those guys. So I had the t-shirt on and Forrest approached me and he goes, Oh, you've been to reptile gardens. And I said, no, no, no. And I just, I ha actually haven't been there yet, but, I, I know the curator. He goes, oh, yeah, Terry. I, I know Terry, too. I, I grew up in, in South Dakota. And uh, ever since that meeting, I mean, it was uh, we were we were best friends at, at first sight, you know, and um, he was we were looking at some condros and he goes, yeah, you know, Terry, Terry has a real nice private. You know, at that time, Terry was big into condros, too, privately outside the zoo and had a really nice condro collection. And he was like, oh, Terry. Terry has some really nice chondros. And I had looked up to Terry for the venomous reptiles and the crocodilians, right? So I when when I found out that Terry was into green tree pythons, that's what made green tree pythons cool for me. Because I was like, if Terry Phillip thinks they're cool, these things must be pretty cool. Um, and and then right after that, it wasn't too Forrest had a vision cage, a six foot vision cage. I just got a black dragon at the time, you know, before black black dragons were mainstream in the industry. And I needed yeah. an enclosure for it. And for Forrest said, oh, I got this six foot vision that that's empty. I'll sell it to you. So I went down there, got the vision. And before too long, we were roommates and, you know, uh, getting getting aspiring plans to move to Florida and you know, break into the reptile industry. You know, I wanted to be in the zoo field and he wanted to do what he ended up doing. And, um, you know, but in that, in that interim, we went Condro crazy and literally every penny that we were making in our jobs that wasn't going to bills was going into designer green tree pythons to, to build the, build up the collection. So and that was in, you know, 2007, 2007, we started building up a condor collection, and man, we had some between Forrest and Des and I, and and Pia, we have we have had some of the world's best condros come through our collection, and we have lost some of the world's best condros, one and only. So the bloodlines may live on somewhere else, but as anybody working with green tree pythons knows. Um, you you know, whatever the whatever the lineage is, each individual is like a fingerprint. You know, you could have animals that are extreme phenotypes out of one clutch, and some that have pretty average phenotypes out of the same clutch. So, you know, we we had some very beautiful animals that we were very lucky and very blessed to 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 get some of these animals. Some of these animals that we, we were able to acquire. That that one is we we called seventy one percent. She was actually a fifty percent 
possible head albino produced by Marshall Mendez. Wow. Yeah, she was named seventy one percent because she was seven. The the, the 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 running saying was she was seventy one percent blue, just like the the ocean in the world. So that that's why her name was. 70, I was confused on the name. I thought, was it a head of some kind or something? What, what is 71%? Oh, right. okay. If that's what it meant. All right. Um, you know, so, so we had, you know, uh, at that same snake shop where we were looking at some chondros, I, they, they got in a, um, uh, adult pair of Lara locality or Larray, however you want to. I said Larray forever. I like the way that Larray sounds, I used to say Libra. but a lot of people say Larray. I used to say Libra. I guess I've been saying it both completely wrong this whole time. It's like California oh. accent. I like Larray. I like Larray. That's sick. Yeah, Larray was good. And, and, and now looking at it, there were supposed to be animals that were uh, Bushmaster animals that were raised up, but no documentation. And we were pretty yeah. convinced that they were... Um, uh, 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 Kafio Island green trees that that had just gone a powdery green, you know, and 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 not not stayed yellow because we had produced from them and the baby stayed just yellow for you know years and years and years and looked like a canary. So it was very hard to say, but I got those animals as adults and they they started locking up right away. We ended up getting seventeen eggs and hatched them and got fifteen babies. And every single one of them was a runner. You know, a lot of you chondro folks out there know exactly what a runner is. And that's a, when you're trying Terrible. to establish them and tea feed them. Yeah, and they don't want to strike. They don't want to bite. All they want to do is, is get you're away gonna from you. Me, you're going to force feed that one for a year. Good luck. Yeah, all of them were runners. They were, they were, uh, they were awful. And they really honed my skills on green tree python tea feeding. And as oh. well as uh, uh, arboreal viper teeth feeding. But, uh, you know, what, one of the things Eugene Bissett always would say is, uh, is there's nothing like first time success Be because you, you get, you get that first time success and you think, Oh, I've got it figured out. And then, you know, and then you, you hit all the speed bumps along the way, you know, and, and, uh, and that's what it was too. It's like, Oh, you know, Whenever I see new people on on forums and stuff with green trees, oh, I got a lockup. Oh, I got eggs, and I'm like, all right, let's see what happens when those babies come because that that's the real trial on on what you know that separates the men from the boys. Um, it really, is true, you know, on, on, it, that's what that's where you where yeah. where are you, where are you at mentally? Basically, is what happens when that fucking when you get those baby condos, bro. If you can't handle this and be patient, you're fucked. You're done. It's not gonna work. It's oh man, I've spent I mean I mean I've spent full time job hours tease feeding a handful of neonate arboreal snakes, you know, oh. and, and and you got to sit down with the right mindset too, man. You you can't be frustrated. You got to be zen. You got to sit down and you got to be because the animals pick up on it, man. When you're frustrated, it's like they're gonna be ten times more aggravating to feed, you know you. You really have to be in the right mindset for. I I always find when I have the best luck peace feeding, I I have uh, a, a rested mind. I get get down get into it with a good attitude, and um, the animals respond better to it than when I'm like about to get ready to go somewhere and oh I just got to feed some stuff real quick and I'm like ah oh, just eat the damn you know mouse leg or whatever you know and it, it doesn't end up going as well as you hope. But but over the years from then. Um, we, we continued to, um, acquire new green tree pythons and we've had some, some breeding successes and, and, um, you know, and the nidovirus thing. So man, it's like, it's, it's, it's so, there's so much to it, but, but how, how we found out we had nidovirus in our green tree python collection is we had just taken on somebody who is getting out of chondros usually you know as the story goes when stuff like this happens um we're able to buy their whole colony of breeders and uh juveniles and neonates enclosures everything a full and you know full buyout the person was uh, retiring wanted to get out of 
that and we had a good relationship with that person at that time and um you know we got these animals and within the first couple weeks it was obvious that there was something not right but in the collection and we had animals that were dropping like flies of respiratory problems would 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 get would get a, a respiratory and be be dead a respiratory dead um you know and and it was spreading like a wildfire and we were sending animals out for, i mean and, and we spent a small fortune on this group as you could imagine i mean we had some of the best bloodlines of green tree pythons on the planet. And, just, to give, um, just, to give the people, know, just to give the people an idea, like like ballpark, like at least six figures, right? Like let these people know around how much, not not the exact figure, but around how much in chondros did you lose? A solid six figures. A solid six figures. Fuck. And and if you talk about the and that's in the animals that died. If you talk about the potential earnings of animals that could have been produced from these i mean you're talking potentially seven figures over years right you know like so you know on, on a clutch or two of animals that are going between two to four thousand dollars or more a baby you know you get three or four clutches of those animals i mean you're making you're you're that that's a significant chunk of change and uh, you know the reason when i got when I got the, when we bought the collection of green tree pythons, I know we're kind of skipping around on timelines a bit. I warned everybody in the beginning too, you know, backstory, backstory, plane, not landing the plane, and all of that stuff. But I was the curator of, of reptiles at the Phoenix Herpetological Sanctuary in, in, um, in Scottsdale, Arizona. I took that job. I was offered the job um, from St. Augustine. I wasn't looking for a job. I was very happy at St. Augustine Alligator Farm. I was the senior reptile keeper there. Um, everybody at the farm is still like very close. Like, I, I mean, I consider everybody at the farm family, um, and, and we still have a strong relationship, but I was offered a curator job at another place and everybody wanted me to, to, to blossom. And, and they they said, you're always welcome back if things don't work out. Um, but, but definitely go take some opportunity. You've been here for five years, you know, go, go, go do some other stuff. And I, with that, we left. Um, didn't work out. Um, the facility and us were on two separate pages. I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty stuff and keep it professional. But um, I resigned from the facility. And, and during that time, you know, the, the farm had a full staff. And as much as they loved me, I would like to think um, that they're not going to let somebody go just to bring me back. So um, right. my wife, Pia, which many of the people that are watching right now know um, and you know, uh, uh she yeah. was lucky enough to land <laughs> she was she was lucky enough to land a position at uh, uh disney's animal kingdom in the in the veterinary uh department there as a veterinary nurse um she's p has got all kinds of certifications and specialties and, and everything and exotics and so she landed like a phenomenal job there so, so she, she had that job. And at that time, that was my leave. That was my kind of segue into, um, you know, entrepreneur. Uh, she is the real deal. Yes, she is. She is definitely the real deal. Um, but, uh, you know, that was kind of my segue into entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, Forrest was a big entrepreneur, um, you know, forged his way over a lot of different stuff. And, and uh, a lot of that was uh, was very influential on, on me. And, uh, you know, I had wanted to do my own thing as well. So uh, my interest in green tree pythons, knowing that in designer green tree pythons, they carry a hefty price tag. And at this point, I, I've got a lot of experience with the animals and feel very skilled and and uh, are very, are very um, uh capable of, of working with breeding, producing and, and rearing and, 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 and doing well with these animals. I had already bred them and um, these were bloodlines and, and, and lineages that I was really um, passionate about. So we, we made the financial decision to buy this colony of green tree pythons 
and this was going to be my income. You know, like Pia had her professional day job uh, with what she was doing. And in the interim of me not being at a zoo and, and, and you know, whatnot, this was uh, a way to make a, a decent, respectable living and still be doing reptiles and also um, kind of march into the beat of, of my own drums. So it, it, was, it was great. It was a fun new adventure, you know, or so I thought. <laughs> um, sure. So we get the animals. And uh, yeah, and, and we were, I mean, you could, you could think about the excitement of getting these animals and, um, and all the lineages and you're just thinking about all the potential and everything that you could do and you get these animals and with, you know, with, within the week, they're, they're blowing bubbles and dying and, um, you know, we're, we're just trying to figure out what's going on at this point. And so we're sending out necropsies. And at this point, I'm not, I'm not familiar with what nidovirus is. And at this point, every green tree python person out there is talking about seasonal RIs. And oh yeah, you know, it's normal for a green tree to get, you know, an RI during breeding and stuff. And 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 to me, that always as as a as a lifelong reptile keeper, um, that always just seemed kind of off to me that that why would these animals start wheezing when they breed? Like that's kind of out counterintuitive to, to the species, you know? Um, you know, and green tree pythons if properly cared for are, are really actually some of the easiest, at least in our collection, some of the easiest animals to work with. They're really, you know, if you've got some general reptile sensibility about you and you don't overthink them and you give, you know, you set them up correctly, um, you know, they're, they're not, they're really all, not all that challenging of an animal to work with. So it was really to me that the fact that everybody would say that green trees are so sensitive and we're not talking about fresh off the boat, wild collected green tree pythons that have all kinds of problems, just like any other wild caught snake that you have to nurse back to health to get them into the game. You know, why are these captive bred animals dying all the time from our eyes? And then people would say, oh, it's because the bloodlines, they were inbred so much that they're genetically weak. And, you know, like, yeah, there might've been some inbreeding in the beginning, but a lot of these green tree pythons are really, when you, when you break it down, are, are pretty outcrossed. A lot of these things are outcrossed. I wouldn't say that there's a tremendous amount of inbreeding. And as we know with, with snakes, you could, you could do some selective inbreeding for, for generations and generations with no issues, unless you're breeding in an issue that, that is something that is re, re, uh, replicable. Or, Cody, or, you know, Cody, now there are people like, for instance, there's there's a a, a good mass a majority of people who don't like to spray their chondros, you know, for you know a, a lot of reasons. But they they say the main reasons is you know they don't get RIs or they don't get sick or something from not spraying. And I I see a lot of people always soaking their chondros because they don't they don't fucking spray them. I for instance spray mine. I don't spray them every fucking day, but I spray mine as needed, and I don't have an issue with any of my sheds. Never had RI. So I just want to know why would people, what's up with that? Like, is it just kind of like a preference thing or why, or is it really safer not to spray your animal or spray your chondro? I, you know, honestly, I personally think it's just, you know, some, some, some viral BS that, that just gets spread. And then other people just start regurgitating what somebody else said that they respect like, Oh, chondros don't need misting. You don't need to miss them. They'll drink out of their water bowls and, uh, and, and they'll be fine. You know, and, and then other people kind of get that arrogance about them. And then and they say the same thing. I was definitely on the no mist thing. And they be, oh, you, you don't need to mist them. They drink from their water bowl. And they do. They definitely do drink out from their water bowl. But think about it. This is a sedentary, uh, you know, just like all of these palm vipers behind, behind me. Um, these are sedentary ambush hunters for the most part that live in tropical climates that the water comes to them, you know, the, the, the every morning or every day or whatever they're drinking, um, let's see. <laughs> um, you know, they're drinking off their coils, uh, you know, and they're, they're well hydrated and, and they're usually not seeking water because the water comes to them. In a captive scenario, you put a little water dish in the corner. Now all these, either they have a water feature, they have a water dish, but, but I missed all of these animals too. There's also live plants in there so they're they're missed as well but um 
every time I miss these animals, they drink and they heavily drink. They yep. chug water off their bodies. They drink, they drink, they drink. If you get them on automatic misters and, and those things go off a couple times a day, I, I bet you those animals are gonna drink a couple times a day and they're gonna be hydrated and it's gonna create less issues for your snake. A well hydrated snake is gonna have less issues, less shedding problems, but the ambient humidity does matter. Think about this. This is a tropical snake that comes from animal or a, a, an environment that is that has high humidity. They're thin skinned. You know, if you hold a green tree, they're, they're, they're thin, their skin is not thick. You see their sheds, not a thick skinned animal, you know, and if they dry out, if they're if you have a green tree python in Arizona or California, Nevada or whatever, um, and, and you just give them a water bowl like in Florida, because I grew up in the Southwest, right? I grew up in the desert, so I was used to it. When I moved to Florida, it sucked. The humidity sucks out here. You get used to it a little bit, but not really, because it's like, you know, just muggy and humid and, and whatever. But man, when I when I moved to Arizona, after being in Florida for, for a handful of years, I'll tell you, you could feel the water leaving your body and your lips dry out. And I never had chapped lips. And all of a sudden I had chapped lips and, 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 and I'm just like, I'm not, I'm feeling crummy because the water is leaving my body and I'm not drinking enough water to, to, to replenish that. Well, you got this ambushing, ambush hunting snake that's curled up on a, on a branch or a PVC perch or whatever you have. And you have a water dish in there and occasionally they'll come down and they'll get a drink of water. But then they're sitting there and it's dry. You've got them on paper. This is a tropical snake that most people... Now, you know, you can keep them on paper and you can, there's a lot of husband, you know, there's more than one way to cook a chicken, but you know, we have, we have taken a lot of the things away from these animals that's natural to them. You know, it's like saying to a, a freshwater fish hey, or, or, or saltwater fish, Hey, yeah, I know that you live in saltwater, but I want you to be freshwater now. So I'm going to just dump you in my freshwater tank and you're just going to have to figure that out and you're going to have to live, you know, like it's probably not going to work out too well so you take a tropical snake that gets rained on all the time and drinks off its own body and has plant plants all around them and vegetation to hide in and then you put them in this i always i always laugh you know and i'm guilty of it too i mean you can see some of our old setups i've had pvc pipe perches with 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 newspaper and 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 mulch or whatever so i'm guilty of it too but i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna poke poke fun at myself as well because you know now as we go move forward with green trees, I would love to have everybody in naturally planted setups where they could, with automatic misters, where these animals could drink every time that they get misted on and be hydrated and not have to just sit there on a perch on a dry piece of paper with no leaf litter, no foliage. This is an animal that likes security and likes to be tucked in, in vegetation. And they're just exposed on this very sad looking PVC perch or, you know, people that now they're throwing those little those, 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 those little like plastic garden, uh, you know, coat hangers. yeah, plastic, plastic coat hangers. And it's like, and that, that now we, we put trash in their enclosures, to, you know, for perching instead of natural branches. And people say, oh, we can't put a branch in there because there might be a problem with the branch. We must bake it in the oven at 400 degrees for 10 hours to make sure everything is is cooked off of it and stuff and it's like you know just give these animals some natural perching and give them some cover put in a put in a pothos put in some uv light everybody likes to argue with uv and say it's not necessary these animals live out in the sun if you don't understand how how uv and and all that stuff works uh everybody go do yourself a favor go pick up this book it's called uh, bioactivity the theory of wild recreation written by john courtney smith he's a european guy he also did a podcast with uh um the chame the chameleon the podcast the dragon strand um who's who's that uh i can't think off the top of my head um dragon strand cages do you know mj i'm trying to think i don't think i don't know i'm not sure who that is Man, I uh, I know him too, and it's a good podcast. John Courtney Smith was on there, so it's a Chameleon podcast, Chameleon Keepers podcast. 
I'm butchering it right now. I really apologize, but I've listened to it a few times. Butchered. Bioactivity, the theory, the the the, the, the uh, bioactivity, the theory of wild recreation, written by John Courtney Smith, breaks down how UV works, balancing off of plants and rocks and and all of that stuff. And and these animals, whether or not we think they're getting a, a any level of UV, they really are. A lot of these companies like Zoomed, Zilla, Exoterra are making you know, Arcadia. Arcadia is making some really good UV bulbs and stuff. You know, like now more than ever, we have more husbandry tools that we never had before to make a better life for these animals and do wild recreation in a artificial environment. Um, you know, a lot of these products, they're, they're not cheap, but they're also affordable too. And it's and it's really fun to tinker with some of these tools. It's kind of like it, it like I don't I don't get excited about like um, there you go there you go there's the book. I don't get excited about uh, you know material things. So so I really actually get excited about different equipment that I could use for the animals that will make their lives better. And all these uh, all these things are are really something that is really going to benefit these animals a whole lot. Um, this book I read it cover to cover. Um, you know, I got a forest hook on those books and, and forest read them. And it gives you a lot better understanding of, of how these animals uh, behave and, and, and what they do in the wild and some necessary things. So a lot of the condor keeper, uh, you know, enthusiasts, they, you know, they think bioactivity is the devil. And, you know, if you keep a bioactive setup, though, you know, AKA never gets cleaned and, and all this stuff. And it's like, there, there is a process, you know, a lot of these, uh, um saltwater aquariums and stuff it, it's an artificial environment there's a lot of stuff that you have to keep in check ph and all of this stuff and you have to monitor these setups but those are those are bioactive setups there's a lot of stuff going on there you know biofiltration and mechanical filtration and you have to keep all of these things um in balance and that it's no different for a bioactive setup you don't just plant it throw in some isopods and call it a day you know, you have to, you have to monitor it and you do have to make adjustments and you have to, you know, so it's like the people that are, are speaking negatively uh, about bioactive setups that are, got, are chondro people. Um, I just don't think they have the experience that uh, to, to really justify the, you know, that, you know, and if you don't, if you don't have the experience, the sterile way of doing it is, uh, is something that's gonna um that's gonna uh benefit you you know sometimes less let me ask you this cody are you against people who don't go the bioactive route if they keep chondros no no not even a little bit because i mean we've got some chondros right now that you know we've we've got some pvc perches and and some pretty um some pretty uh you know basic setups that do the animal well, um, you know, nothing wrong with it. But I just think overall, you know, for, for the lifetime of the animal and, and the enjoyment of for the animal of different enrichment items in the enclosures, UV, natural plants, natural perching, you know, I've worked with a few green tree pythons and zoos that, that have been in the, their age bracket is in the high 20s or early right. 30s. These animals that have lived over, you know, that are like up to 30 years and, you know, all these zoos, they, they keep them in natural planted enclosures. They offer UV and all this stuff. And you got to wonder, like, how is that animal living, you know, 20 plus years and everybody loses a condor at like six years old after it breeds once and stuff, you know, it, 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 I, I feel like um, you know, I mean, it might not just be solely due to because they, they have a natural setup, but but I think over the long term, you know, it's it, it's good for the animals. But but some but if you are not dialed in those setups, or you can't really, you know, it's not something that that is feasible for you. Uh, a simple setup, so like I said, sometimes less is more, and you're not and not complicating the situation, you know, the scenario. Like if it's not something that you fully understand, don't do it. I, I had a good understanding of, of the bioactive systems. Um, so for me, I feel very comfortable doing a bioactive setup um, as well as a basic one. If I got to throw something in a setup real quick and I don't have time, you know, especially for quarantine. For quarantine, when you bring in a new animal, you don't want to just throw in an animal in a bioactive setup because if it has, 
if it has nidovirus or if it has mites or if it has cryptosporidium or some other kind of virus and you just put it into that system that you've been growing for a year, guess what you got to do now? You got to break that whole thing down and, and sterilize the whole thing and start over. So, so I wouldn't suggest putting anything in a bioactive setup until you have cleared it from quarantine, tested it for, for all the major known viruses and, and ailments of that species, make sure it has no endoparasites, which are internal parasites or ectoparasites like your mites, because depending on if they have a direct or indirect life cycle, if they have internal parasites that, that they pass in, in, in feces that go into the, the, the soil or bioactive setup, um, then, then the, the cycle never stops and the animals will continue to get the, you'll never rid them of parasites. So you want to make sure that they're clean before they're going into a setup like that, or you could really make some health for yourself. Um, you know, but, but no, I'm never going to knock anybody for not doing a bioactive setup, but I personally love them. I think that they are, they're, uh, beautiful. And, um, I think the animals do get a lot of enrichment from those kind of setups, which, which helps increase the lifespan because I think it also reduces stress. I think a lot of these problems that we see, um, are, um, are produced by stress. You know, the animals are stressed out because they don't have enough security or something that allows some of these things to take hold and really consume the animal where I think a naturalistic setup with a lot of cover uh, and enrichment like UV, but you could say enrichment or a necessity. Is it, a, is it just something nice to do or is it really a necessity? We don't really know because there's not enough studies being done out there to really show it. But if it doesn't negatively impact them and could benefit them, I would use it. So every like we use a lot of UV on snakes because we just think that it's better for them. At the same time, there are snakes that are in racks that that are it's, it's, it's surplus holding and it works, you know, cobras and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I would love to get them in a better setup, but but it's it's good for now and it works. So like I said, there's more than one way to cook a chicken. But if I had my my preference, I'd have everything naturally planted. I'd have everything on, on, on UV. Um, outdoors is better. If you could get things outdoors, um, that's the way to go. You know, if, if you're able to do that, because then you don't have to pay for UV bulbs and, and all of that, you know, you get it from the, from, from the world. And um, it's, uh, it's a little less maintenance keep things outdoors if you could do it. Um, but if you can't, I mean, Exoterra, Zoomed, and Zilla make phenomenal enclosures that allow for, for really awesome lighting and ventilation and everything. I, I really can't say a bad thing about any of those companies because I use them all. I'm friends with all the top guys in Zoomed, Zilla, and, and Exoterra. And, and I like their products for different reasons. And, and, and Arcadia, um, you know, Arcadia is really good, you know, up the comer with the lighting and stuff. But I, I think that, uh, you know, do better for your reptiles, you know, don't be cheap, don't be lazy. Um, you know, if you're going to spend thousands of dollars on a green tree python, don't just put it, uh, you know, in an enclosure with uh, with some old classified ads from the newspaper and a and a and a and a, and a, and a coat hanger and a six pack wrapper for it to perch on, you know, yeah, give it a little bit more. But but for but but for a but for a, a quarantine setup, that's OK. You know, that it's OK for now. I'm not going to I'm not going to knock somebody too hard for that. Whatever. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh no, I'm just kidding, bro. No, that's that's it's definitely true, man. It's if that's that's the biggest thing. If you could do more for your animal, why not? You know what I mean? I'll tell you the biggest change I've done last year for all my chondros, basically everything everything in this room has like a pothos plant. Like I have a little bit of enrichment in everything, and I don't know why, I just I just felt better just by doing that. You know what I mean? Um I will say though, me, for instance, like as sick as I love a bioactive thing, that's just not my preference. I personally don't want to have to maintain a bioactive uh, enclosure, especially if I have over 20 chondros, you know what I mean? So, um, but you know, if I could do anything to enrich, enrich the enclosure and stuff like that, just by adding a pothos plant, you know, I mean, all, all for it. I feel like everyone, like you said, could just do a little better. You know what I mean? Well, and here's the thing too, is by, by putting natural plants in there, 
you're also increasing the oxygen levels in the enclosures. That's a benefit. A lot of the times we'll just do a pothos clipping in the water dish because right. pothos is amazing because it, it could grow anywhere. It could be, um, you know, a terrestrial plant or you can make it an aquatic plant. We use it a lot. Uh, I've got some uh, some Orinoco crocodiles right now that have pothos clippings in their in their and they've got some basic their their hatchlings um, nice. that were that were uh, pr produced at Gladys Porter Zoo and uh, we we just have them in in uh, ten gallons right now with some pothos and a and a, a basking platform. Uh, the pothos are for cover, but the, they they get some roots going on in there and it just uh, you know. Ed it adds some cover. It adds some oxygen. Um, we're going to get those guys outside come uh, come uh, better weather. It's a little too chilly to to risk putting you know uh, orno baby Orinocos out outside. You know we'll we'll have them in in, in a uh, in a waterland outside. We have a you know perimeter fence with all the you know stuff to to contain crocodiles and and what have you. But um, you know because North Florida we get pretty cold. We've had some nights in in the in the thirties. And, you know, that's just not an animal I want to risk, um, you know, having, having a problem with. But, um, no. you know, as far as, as pothos go, man, we use them for all different kinds of stuff. And we'll clip them and put them in a chondro water dish. They'll grow roots. And I'll tell you what, the water in a water dish is going to stay fresher, longer with, with pothos in it, with, with a good root ball going. Because that, those roots are going to help filter that water you know a lot of people are um are, are using the copper trick the the copper penny dated uh you know 1982 or before where it's true copper um and uh you know pop that and people do that pop it in the water dish and it helps you know keep the water dish clean i, I i've not done that you know i i'd like to know a little bit more uh behind that before before you know dropping a penny into a into a water dish, but I know a lot of people that, that are doing that and, uh, you know, and, and say it keeps the water dish cleaner. They don't get that little slime around the, the water dish that after about a week that you, that you feel, I'll give it a try at some point, but to be completely honest with you, you get a nice pothos in there with a good root ball. It's keeping that water clean. You're getting a little bit of biological filtration in there. You're getting a little more oxygen in there and it definitely can't hurt. And it gives you a garnish of color. It gives you a garnish right. of color in 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 the enclosure, and, and I really like them. So you could do a you could do a basic sterile setup and still do some plants. You could put it, you know, in an adult chondro cage. You could put a six quart Tupperware in there with some pothos clippings. If you got a light in there, you know, and that's going to grow out, and you're going to have a nice, you know, water base, and 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 they could drink out of that if they want to, and then the the pothos can do its thing. So you know, it's it, it's a matter of preference, but. I bet you if you come here and you kind of see what's going on here, I, I, I think you you uh, may have a different opinion of some bioactive. So all it takes is one bioactive setup to really play with and get dialed in. And then before you know it, you're going to hate every one of your other setups because you're going to just be so infatuated with bioactive. But, Cody, uh, I, I will say I will say right now, your collection, your room is probably the top bucket list collection i want to go see in person like that bad i want to see it very very bad it's so sick from what i can tell and from everyone from steven even forest i mean anyone who's even socrates one of my fucking best friends socrates has been senior pad like i've heard nothing but just amazing things and i could just tell like how sick i could just tell literally literally through pictures how sick that room how sick your room is and i could tell a lot of a lot of thought and training and patience and like i think this is just a shot of your hatching rack which i don't have this shot of your actual like enclosures but this is a and it's kind of blurry but this is just your hatching rack right so that's your safety protocol with the pole going down in front of these right yep 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 those are habitat system racks that we did some custom led lighting in there so we could uh, you know because they're in these clear cambro so tubs cool that uh you know like it almost defeated the purpose to have a clear tub in a dark rack where you can't really enjoy the animal that much so we put some custom led lights in there where we could still slide in the tubs and and not be in the way of the lights and then we could put some live plants in there that would grow and then we yeah we've got a dowel in the front that has a lock on it so so anything that's venomous you know is secured and, and up to our codes here but 
but yeah, so so in there we got some green tree pythons and and some, all that. Some all that was on, things. all that's on like on substrate you create like in that in that hatching rack in particular. All that's on substrate that you mixed yourself, correct? Um, some of it might have been, but um, and, and those uh, I think a lot of it was a little basic. Uh, mulch probably as a base, even though I'm you know, mulch is good when you need it in in a hurry. But I'll put like leaf litter on top of that and and kind of do uh, a, a little bit more as for as far as not just having um, mulch by itself. Um, you know, because I, I always hate the way that it looks and and it just looks kind of uncomfortable to me if I was a snake like just big splinters of wood um and it's not supernatural but but if you put leaf litter on top of that and we we live in a really awesome part of florida where we've got some beautiful um yeah. different species of oak trees on our on our property so so we're able to just cut branches and and get leaves and dry them out ourselves and um and get some really nice leaf litter to add on top of the mulch and then, and then that makes a pretty nice basic setup, you know, like you could do elaborate where we do some ABG mixture where we put peat and sphagnum moss and, and horticultural charcoal and, and, and orchid bark and tree fern and, and all the different stuff to make a real, you know, nice uh, forest floor mixture. But, uh, you know, if we're doing a quarantine setup where I don't want to, because a lot of those, those things are very expensive. Um, you know, and in a quarantine setup, you don't want to, you know, if there's a problem with an animal, you don't want to unload all your, your most expensive substrate into something. So, so mulch yeah. is a good thing, with, but with leaf litter to help kind of make it a little bit more natural. And then when animals are eating, especially if it's like a frozen thawed, you know, rodent where they're dragging it around and they're getting substrate on it and stuff, leaves are really nice because even if they stick to it it's like it's going to fall off when the animal starts eating they're not going to be covered in mulch or aspen or whatever um so leaf litters for your tropical stuff is, is pretty nice but but yeah i think there's a combination of stuff in that in that rack everything that's behind me is all um is all uh, abg uh, soils that was uh prepared in-house yeah i can already tell you which like stands... no go go ahead which what I was going to say, which the ABG for, for those who may not know is a, is an acronym that stands for Atlanta Botanical Gardens. Um, the, in, in, in Georgia, it's a beautiful, um, like greenhouse that is, uh, you know, like just, I haven't been there, but, but, uh, the Atlanta Botanical Gardens created this, um, this soil mixture for, for a lot of their stuff that they, they do there for, for these kind of, um, environments and the uh, dart frog people really, um, really took to this and then started making their own mixtures and kind of tweaking the, the recipes a little bit. But um, I, I think probably the dart frog community is the, the most well known for, for, for ABG, uh, the Atlanta Botanical Gardens mixture of soil and the ingredients that goes into it. But it could be utilized from dart frogs to palm vipers to chondros to pretty much anything that's tropical in a tropical environment and uh you know the ingredients in it last years and years and break down very slowly and um at you know you could add different nutrients to the soils to keep them going and it's just a really cool little mixture of, of soils and i really enjoy them all right, I'm looking at a. I let I, I I'm looking at the plane meeting. We're going really really north right now, so we're, we're going to direct us right back down here just a little bit back to the Nido. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you just you simply, you know, explain all that fucking beautiful collection for the most part wiped out, right? Gone, right? For the I mean, it, yeah, I mean, so, so, in so. In yeah, yeah. So so after we got it, we started losing animals and dropping like flies. We were um, we were knee crossing and we weren't quite you know we weren't testing for the for the right thing we were getting close getting close figuring out oh there's a virus what is it finally we we identified it as nidovirus Pia she had been to one of the veterinary conferences where they were one of the vets was doing a presentation on um, on uh, nidovirus and ball pythons, I think it was. And, uh, and and she was like, you know what? A lot of the things that we are experiencing here seem very similar to what 
uh, I listened to a night of virus and ball pythons. So then we started and then Pia said that I, I think you know, she had some colleagues um, in, uh, in Colorado at the Colorado uh, State University CSU that uh, Dr. Mark Stingling and, and uh, Dr. Laura Hoonhanks, who was writing a PhD on nidovirus. And Pia reached out to them to see if they were still doing that research. And they said that they were. And we said that we think that we have animals that are positive for this virus. Um, so we got included on that study. And it, this is a published paper. Um, with animals in our collection, you know, and other collections as well that that participate in the in the research, but um, we we would do quarterly samples every three or four months of of samples and swab the animals, and we we were able to identify everybody in the collection who had nidovirus and the ones who didn't have nidovirus. So we 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 separated them into two groups. The nidovirus positive group, which got its own building, a separate building away from everything else. And then the nidovirus negative group um, that was isolated away from them. And then we and and, uh, and then and then we were doing um, we were doing, uh, you know, quarterly studies to make sure that those animals uh, were, were um, can you still hear me? My one AirPod died. Uh, yeah, you're good. So. You're good. I can still hear you. Okay. All right. I think I got. I think I got you back on on this one. You good? You can hear me. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. All right. Good deal. Um. So, uh, you know, we separated the two groups, and then we can we continued to, um, you know, monitor them and uh, uh, do the swabs and. And, and track the virus in these animals. If an animal died of nidovirus, we would send it to the University of, of Colorado or Colorado State University. They'd do the necropsy and they would, they would um, you know, add additional data to their, um, to, to, to the research that they were doing. Um, so during that time, we lost a lot of that group of green tree pythons um, which was was really really obviously bad, but a lot of a lot of good stuff came from it because we were very public about that from the beginning. You know, we had a very well known uh, group of green tree pythons, and we were we had bred them, and we wanted to make sure that people knew what was going on. I didn't want to be, tr you know, trying to swindle people and sell an animal that that had a virus and then just make up some good. excuse that. That oh yeah no it was fine before I sent it out or or whatever kind of BS um, you know but but we didn't we we wanted to make sure we knew what we were talking about before we really came out about it so once we figured out that we had nidovirus like there was no, no more animals coming in I mean, no more new acquisitions and there were no animals going out there was nothing that was ever sold or anything um, you know and a lot of people you know with, with an animal group you know six figure group like that when you find out that you have a virus you know, a lot of these negative animals, they, they, they didn't have any symptoms, you know, I, I figure, you know, or, or a lot of these positive animals were asymptomatic too, and didn't have any symptoms. And, and I know a ton of people that would probably, you know, just say, hey, I'm going to sell these animals yeah. and, um, and, not, and not tell anybody to try to make their money back. But that, you know, that little integrity thing kicks in and, and, and you go, you know, I don't want to do that because I, you know, what happened to me, I don't want to happen to somebody else and one snake could kill somebody's entire collection you know if it goes right in there so so we wanted to know more so we were we we ended up breeding two of the nidovirus positive green tree pythons together and we got a clutch of 17 eggs and um uh we set them up in two groups there was one mass of eggs that was adhered together i didn't un, i didn't pull them apart I set them up in one egg box, and then there was uh, three eggs that were kicked off to the side. Um, okay. So there were 14 eggs in a mass, and there were three eggs that were kicked off to the side. So we set them up in two different egg containers. One container, the 14, I ran a UV light over them for about a minute to do a little UV sterilization just to see if that did anything and if there was any nidovirus 
you know, uh, on on the um, on the eggs and and see if that would do anything at all. Because you know, in poultry farms and stuff, they do UV sterilization and stuff on the eggs. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to dunk a mass of condor eggs and bleach. So I felt like this was kind of the non-invasive <laughs> potentially. You know, could 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 you know? And and this is a real high-end pairing too. So you know, I don't want to just dunk it in bleach. So I thought, all right, well, you know, I'm gonna do something, you know, but I don't want to, you know. And we agreed, Pia and I, like, let's let's do the UV. So we did. Um, we on the mass of 14, we did the UV for you know a minute or two, and then on the three eggs, we did nothing, if, if I remember, because we we were we our plan was to send the eggs in once they hatch for analysis on on whether they they tested positive for for night of we swabbed the eggs when they were laid and we did all this different stuff and then when the chondros hatched um we they started pipping and they didn't come out of the egg right away so once they started pipping i started setting up each chondro in their egg in their own individual container so we knew which egg belonged to which chondro and then we id'd them and we sent the eggs into um, you know, uh, CSU to, to analyze the eggshells, the yolk, and test for NIDO virus. Um, wow. and, uh, and we had one stillborn. We had one stillborn out of 17. 16 of these eggs hatched. One stillborn. So we sent the stillborn in for a necropsy. And the thing, so, so we got the results back on the eggs once we sent the eggs in. And I wasn't too thrilled. All the eggs tested positive for nidovirus. All the eggs had nidovirus remnants on them. Now, whether they were infectious or not, that can't be determined, at least to my knowledge, or at least not yet. Um, but the, uh, the green tree python itself, the neonate that was dead in the egg, tested negative. The shell tested positive, but the snake was negative. So it was just a regular stillborn. So I'm going, okay, oh, great. You know, the eggs are positive. This isn't very promising. So we started, we swabbed the green trees that had hatched and sent in all the samples. Well, all the green trees that had hatched were all negative for nidovirus. And they can, and they continued to be negative. We're going, they're, they're, they're three years old now. We have three more that are here right now that we're about to send out to, to their new home pretty soon. But they have you know, eight plus ne negative nidovirus tests, or, or it's probably more than that now, um, you know, we'll swab them periodically just to test to see, okay, these animals are not around positive animals or another group that has nidovirus in them. Um, you know, does this, will it manifest itself at some point or whatever? And everybody has maintained being clean um so so that that's some pos there's some positive to that but um you know there was a lot of work and uh, and and frustration and putting your neck out there because we knew the stigma between uh, on viruses when people find out oh there's a, you had a virus you know a lot of people don't want to touch you in a 10 foot pole but our but our thing was we you know, if you're going to keep exotic animals, you're dealing with exotic viruses and bacterias and, 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 and ailments that have existed for millions of years. So it's just a, it's just a part of the game. You know, everybody's just in this little wonderland where it's like, oh, if we keep our temps and humidity, okay, we're going to breed them and we're never going to have a problem. And that's just false. These animals have these, these viruses and these bacterial infections and things that they get. And, and you, it's a part of the game. And if you just stick your head in the sand like an ostrich and just want to not hear it, like see no evil, hear no evil, I'll, you know, you're just not going to be as good of a keeper as you could be. And you're not doing right by your animals. With the new research and stuff that's being done where you can, you know, test these animals for these different ailments and, and make it more affordable to do it. And you are heavily invested in these uh, animals you got to do yourself a favor and 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 the animals favor and, and test these animals to make sure that that they're clean especially if you're going to send them to somebody else like you know if yeah. you have if you're if you're a big python breeder or something 
and you have, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of snakes, it might not be feasible for you to test your entire collection. But it's really on, on the buyer, too, to be informed. You know, at least at least test the animals that, that are going out to a new collection. Maybe you can't right. test all your breeders. But if, but if you do have a respiratory infection, you know, something that where there's an ailment that's obvious, that's clinical, test that animal. If you have an animal that dies, don't just throw it in the trash. Test that, right. necropsy that animal. Like figure out, get your finger on the pulse of your collection and figure out what's going on. There's a lot of very qualified reptile veterinarians. There's a lot of uh, good testing, um, fish head diagnostics, uh, who does uh, nidovirus I've, testing. I've used them. I've used them. Sick. Very, very good. Very good. Uh, and 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 they uh, also do paramixo testing and and adding adding on to that list um, that allows uh, a private keeper to be able to to swab those animals and send, send those tests into a lab and have it re, uh, looked over by a veterinarian. And it, it gives you, uh, it's very good for bringing animals into your collection and quarantine testing and, and getting a baseline on their health. Um, and you, know, hey, you can I'm take not them into not lie, bro. That was very fucking scary. I mean, I only got six uh, tests done. But man, waiting for those fucking results were the scariest things on earth, bro. Because it was just like I was almost ready to have to just accept the truth, you know? Because I mean, here it is, you know. But um, everything came back negative. But I heard you want to. I heard you want to run at least two tests. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I would definitely run two tests at least. So, so there's a couple different quarantines that you could do, and quarantine could be as as, as elaborate or as basic as you have to make it. Uh, you know, I know it's, it's, it's always, it's not the sexy answer, right? Because it's like, it's always a lot of hurt like a, and like emotional you get strain. You get excited, you're all excited. And then you're like, oh, wait, you know, cause you know who told me like, oh, the, the soccer teams was like, well, you want to run two tests. Cause even he's had something pass, And then on the next test, it came back, it came back positive. So that's well, fucking that's the thing too oh. is so, so you could get a new animal into the collection swab it for nidovirus um it comes back clean because maybe that you know in transport or whatever it had um you know stressed the animal out enough yet or whatever to, to pop with some clinical symptoms or whatever but maybe in, in in quarantine or husbandry or temperatures or whatever causes that to manifest itself so so really what you'd want to do is you know isolate your animal the best you can another building would be best um, you know, if it's if it's in another room, that's good. If, if if you only have one snake room that you could put them in, you know, put them on the other side of the room. Work them last. Have a separate set of tools, forceps, and stuff yeah. that only that animal <laughs> uses. And, and um, you know, until you get your tests back, you know. So that's like I said, you could have it as basic or as elaborate of a quarantine you know, as your budget will allow, because something is better than nothing, you know? Um, and it, like the second test, the animal may have manifested clinical symptoms and now there's enough of a viral load to test positive where there wasn't before. So it, the minimum is a, is a three month quarantine, a 90 day quarantine where it's tested in the beginning, uh, a quarantine entrance, and then test it again at the end of that 90 day period on your quarantine exit where, where it would be introduced into the main collection. If you get two negative tests three months apart, uh, using a QPCR test, then PIA and, and Dr. Susan Fogelson and, and other veterinarians could elaborate on the QPCR and all that stuff. That's, that's above my pay grade, so, so I'll leave that for them. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, um, you know, if, if you're using those tests and you get two negatives three months apart, it's a pretty safe bet that that your animal's truly clean and and healthy. Uh, six month quarantine is even better. Some of these, you know, like, like nidovirus is just one thing. These animals could get other ailments, other viruses, and other yeah. things that are, you know, you know, uh, adenoviruses, uh, 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 paramyxoviruses, uh, 
uh, cryptosporidium, which is a protozoa and not a virus. But these are all very bad things. These are very bad things that could cripple a collection and are very good at hiding in these animals. And reptiles are very good at hiding symptoms. And, and they may, and, and these animals may be asymptomatic carriers that may be themselves outwardly healthy, but could infect uh, other members of the collection and, and possibly destroy a collection. One of our one of our green tree pythons in our nidovirus building, um, he's been positive since day one. He's been asymptomatic since day one. He carried one of the higher highest viral loads out of all the ones that were tested, and to this day, he's he's maintained perfect outward health. He's never had a respiratory symptoms. He's never had a dry shed. He's out. Like if you just went by a basic quarantine of three months of, oh, he's good to go. You would never know this animal was positive with that virus. That's why testing things on that level is like, you just don't know unless you test. And you don't know how it's going to affect other animals. Some animals may not be, you know, it's like coronavirus. It's coronavirus may be, and nidovirus is in, in the same kind of category as, as coronaviruses. And, you know, you just don't know how it's going to affect a person. You know, somebody might just get an itchy throat and maybe lose some smell or taste for a little bit and other, all the way up to people dying. So, you know, you could have a chondro that is positive for nidovirus that is, is outwardly the epitome of health. And then you have an animal that gets it and he's dead in a week from nidovirus. So you just don't really know how each individual is going to act until you know or react to it until you, you know. But that one male that we have, Morpheus, is a dream lemon blue line animal. And he's one of the, the most amazing, one of my favorite green tree pythons ever you know, in the, was in the collection of Greg Maxwell, then Andrew Kelly and Bobby Keller and, and, um, and now right. ours. And, and um, we, uh, and, and, and he's positive, man. And he's, and he is a great snake and an outwardly very healthy snake, but he's positive. And we know he's positive because we've tested and that, that gives us insight to the virus and how to handle things and stuff. But as far as like, you know, people moving forward with their collections and stuff, you know, I don't think it's something, you know, you're going to deal with viruses, whether you know it or not, you're going to have them in your collection. And I, I don't, you know, like, it, it's just a matter of time, you know, what will it wipe out your whole collection? You know, maybe, maybe not, uh, you know, you might have a death or two, you might not have anything, you might not even know anything's there when people say, Oh, I've never had an issue. Well, that you know of our, our unique crop, seeing animals that die? Are you doing a proper quarantine where you're testing animals? Zoos, zoos, when animals come in, even from another zoo, they're quarantining, testing. Um, they're doing adequate lengths of, of testing, three months to six months with all the appropriate blood work and, and everything to get a baseline on their health. And even though it's coming from another zoo, they're not taking any chances and, and they're identifying problems. And that happens, zoos get viruses and problems too. You know, they're, they're not exempt from that, even though they do all of these things. So, you know, don't be in denial. If you're gonna be a professional with working with reptiles and you're gonna be a breeder and stuff, uh, don't be a shitty one. And don't give somebody a snake that's gonna kill their whole collection. And, and, and the person, the buyer needs to be educated about these different ailments that these animals can get and, and take it upon themselves to contact a veterinarian or find out how they can get these testing, uh, the, these tests ran to identify these issues before their problems. And you just have to be in the know. And because of a social, you know, social media is great and it's bad all at the same time, you know, but it's great because we could share information like this and where we weren't able to do that before. And really, you know, like the more people that are starting to come out, like, oh, I've had an issue, oh, I've had a virus, more and more and more people are testing now once we came out about our issues because, you know, like people don't want to talk about it. But then when you talk about it and you go, listen, it's not because you're a bad keeper. It's not because you did anything wrong. Sometimes these things get these things and you just have to, you have to roll with the punches 
and learn how to manage a collection when when these these things show their ugly faces. And yeah. um, you know, we've had we've had we've had nidovirus in our collection. We've had paramyxovirus in our collection. We've had para, uh, cryptosporidium in our collection. You know, and these Terrible. are things that people would usually never admit to, right? They would never admit right. to that because because it's it's their pride and their ego that they're not a great keeper. And at this point, I've realized that those things, you know, when that stuff happens, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not a good keeper. You know, like a lot of these animals are are, are clinically healthy that test positive for these these ailments. So what do you do with an animal that is clinically healthy but tests positive? for something like nidovirus. We have seen that when we tested two or bred two nidovirus positive animals, we got negative babies. So, okay, and we have a collection of nidopositive animals that are outwardly doing healthy. I would identify issues. And if you're serious about breeding them, you don't have to immediately euthanize your positive animals. Just have a designated area for them. If they're, if they're asymptomatic and clinically healthy, keep them, breed them when they get, when you, they get give you eggs or babies, you know, if they're live bears, move them immediately from the breeders areas, isolate them, test them, make sure they're negative. And if they're negative after two or three tests, you know, you could, you can move them. And I would also be very honest with the person you're selling to or sending animals to people appreciate the honesty. People are afraid of what they don't know, you know, with venomous stuff and, and all that people are afraid of what they don't know. So one of the things when we're talking to people about nidovirus, a very taboo topic or paramyxo, so we tell people what we've done. We have an isolated building. We test our animals. Yes, we have positive animals, but an animal that we send you is going to have multiple negative tests. And we're going to send you that documentation that was reviewed by a veterinarian. Then it's just not our word that you got a, a clinically healthy animal that is tested disease free. And it's the best you could do. Or do you want to get a snake from somebody that tells you that they've never had a mite and it's completely full of shit? So, like, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can pick your, you, you can pick your poison. But you know, our, our, our upfrontness with people on the virus aspect, yeah, there are people that are probably like a little iffy about it. But then, you know, we, a lot of those uh, nidovirus negative green tree pythons that we produce from a really good bloodline. Um, the, the, we're, we're sending out the, the last three that we have very soon, three-year-old animals, um, you know, and we, uh, the, the rest of them, uh, everybody who got them is very happy with them. They've all turned into very spectacular animals, animals that I, you know, you always regret sending off because they, they are so good. You know, people ended up with some really awesome stuff. And sometimes you got to let some of that really good stuff go. So people, you can't hoard it all for yourself. So there's some green tree python people out there that got these uh, these neonates that that were a part of some chondro history on testing for nidovirus that were negative and all the cool stuff behind that, but also some phenomenal bloodlines. And now I'm I'm short a bunch of cool blue and black snakes because I sent people the coolest stuff that we produced, but at least they're happy with it. But you know, and we we sold a lot of those snakes for an absolute premium. I mean, there wasn't there wasn't a neonate in that clutch that sold for less than three thousand dollars. That three three thousand to forty five hundred for 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 these neonates, and yeah. and these customers were 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 happy to pay it, um, and yeah. and and saw the value in it because not only were they getting great bloodlines, but they they had disease tested and disease free animals. That with all that research to back it up, and and that stuff never hindered our sales. Talking saying that we had uh, positive animals, but it was because we we thoroughly explained it to everybody. You know, like you, you can make your own decision. If, if you're uncomfortable with it, you're not going to spend the money. But uh, you know, it it did the. You know, there were people that were like, man, if you come out with this. Nobody's gonna want to ever buy get any snakes from you, and it really was the exact opposite. We got a lot of, you know, it's the integrity thing, you know. Integrity is what you're doing when when nobody's looking, and and I think a lot of the people appreciated that. And then and then the snowball effect after we came out, and and then you know somebody else tests and they come out, and the more people are are coming out about having a virus or something 
there are more people that are willing to help and not get crucified for having a virus. You know, people are nervous because they're like, oh, like people are gonna excommunicate me from the industry. But but really it's the exact opposite. And it's it's just a part of the territory. If you're gonna work with exotic animals, you're gonna you're gonna be working with exotic viruses and ailments that we don't have a great understanding of. And we're we're learning every day. Even the top professionals and researchers will, you know, when we were in the beginning stages of all the nidovirus research, you know, there was a lot of I don't knows on the research. And we're asking all these questions about how the virus works and how it's transferred and, and what disinfectants are killing the virus and stuff. And the, the top PhD people researching this stuff with, you know, I was in the labs and they were showing us equipment that they were using, some little thing that looks like a, like a fax machine that does something that identifies different strains of viruses. That's like a $300,000, $500,000 machine you know, wow. that that's sequencing out viruses and stuff like that, you know, and, and I get, a, you know, we, we don't fully understand it yet. You know, these guys are owning, hey, we don't, you know, we're the authorities, we still have on, on the subject, we still have a lot to learn on the subject. So, you know, just, uh, just good husbandry practices, testing for, for what you can test for, observing your animals for, for obscure behavior, and and all that you know it's it nidovirus is out there it's nobody's fault it's 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 a thing that's been around forever and people have been selling trading breeding snakes forever with 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 a very naive attitude on viruses you know it's just like oh good husbandry and that's all you have to do but with all these breeding loans and lack of quarantine procedures these things have been spreading like coronavirus right so um, you know, the people that know these about these viruses and how to test for them. And, um, you know, like th these are uh, the beginning stages of just, you can develop a clean collection. If you have a process of bringing an animal and you're not overzealous about buying, you know, shit tons of animals and, and whatever, and you bring in a couple animals at a time, preferably from the same source, quarantine them for three months, get two negative tests before you move them to the, the main collection. Is it going to eliminate all problems? No. You know, maybe you test for nidovirus and it comes back negative, but the damn thing has crypto and you didn't test for that. So there, yeah. there, there is, you know, there, there, there's all kinds of stuff, but you just, um, you, you just have to you be studious of everything yes. that's going on in this. So, it's so much to learn, man. It's a lot it to take in, and it's it's stressful. It is. It's yeah. It's, I'm saying, like you know, it's not for. It's not meant. That's what I'm saying. If you really are doing everything you can, like if you really dig deep on this, this 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 whole animal thing, keeping and breeding is really not meant not meant for everybody. But people are just selfish, and they want to do what they want to do. And you know, it's is it's crazy because. Like, here's another issue. Like, you know, as, as bad as, like, will we ever get people to stop free handling? More than likely not. Like, even off camera, probably more likely not, right? But will we ever get anybody to all admit that they got a disease or something that's fucking up their collection? Dude, there's people that will never admit that, bro. I don't give a fuck. Like, they'll, they don't care. Cause I've already spoken to people and I know they got it and they won't, they won't speak up and say that they got it ever to God. They won't ever say it ever. Right. So, no, there. Yeah, that's that's a that's a, a, a for sure a real thing. Um, and yeah. uh, you know, it, and, and and the free handling stuff too. It's like, yeah, well, will you ever stop everybody from doing that? Or uh, you know, you know, probably not. But but having the conversations like we just did about the you know, like a lot of the people that do it, they, they've got their fans, and they'll say, oh, they'll they'll justify the reasons why they think they should do that. But, um, you know, there, there are people that, that don't know, like, obviously it, it should be common sense that picking up a Cobra with your bare hands is, is probably not smart, but, but sometimes you have to be told that that's not smart. So if we're having this conversation and we're having, say, you know, showing the other side of it, there may be somebody that's watching this, that this influences them for the positive yeah. and changes it. Oh, hey, that's not cool. And, and 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 maybe he prevented somebody from going that route. When we're talking about nidoviruses and different viruses and testing and stuff, maybe there's somebody that's 
we, like they're never going to test their their snakes or whatever. But maybe maybe there's somebody that's a new snake keeper that's that's just only got a handful of snakes, and they hear this now early on before they have 300 snakes, and they do proper quarantine when they're when they're acquiring new animals and testing them and segregating positive animals or or euthanizing or whatever they want to do. But but they're now they're more informed and, and they can make a better educated decision. There are some people that will never test. They don't want to know the answers and they want to play that ignorant game forever. But then there are people that hear that and go, listen, I want to be in the know. I want to I want to do better for me. I want to do better for the person that I'm going to send an animal to. I want to do better for the animals. And, and they're going to respond by actually going the extra mile and testing and spending the money. And, and, and you just got to put that out there so people can hear it yeah. and they can make the decision for themselves. Cause I mean, you got to think about it like this, like what, like, okay. Like for instance, what is Cody and, and Pia mostly respected for that now everything that they do sell or anything has proof that it's clean. And if you're known to have that kind of reputation, you will never be questioned for anything that you do. And you could just like, it's evolving. You're just evolving into what, like what you guys did too, man. Like it's, it's crazy. In, you know, information that's not put out there. It's only going to hold us back. You know what I mean? So oh, 100%. I, 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 I commend you what you and Pia did by it. That dude, that's right there. That's some real deal shit right there. That's, that's doing it more than just, self or even that's doing it as a whole like for the whole community of who's who's keeping reptiles because you do want to see this eventually you know get 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 resolved or find a solution to fucking knock this nido down as much as we can or just be aware of when it's happening or who it's coming from or you know stuff like that so but yeah good shit bro good shit um yeah yeah you're just you're just you're just eliminating variables when you're dad thing and you're just you're, you're creating a better stronger collection and it's uh it it, it really it, it felt like it when we when we figured out what we were dealing with we 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 kept it under wraps for about a year because we were involved in the research we weren't selling anything or acquiring any new python or anything um and we were learning the whole time because we didn't want to immediately come out and say hey we have a virus because that we don't fully understand. Now there's other research that's been done and stuff, and maybe there's some veterinarians and researchers that at that time that may have understood a little bit more about it. But for yeah. us and what we were dealing with in a green tree python, uh, green tree python collection, that was all new to us. So we were involved with the CSU research and we're, we're learning and we're learning what's going on with our collection. And we were lucky enough to get that clutch from two positive animals. So it was a great opportunity to learn we wanted to hatch them and test them and figure out what was going on with the babies and have a, have something of sub of uh, something of substance to bring to the masses because if we just said hey, hey we had a virus that killed all of our green tree pythons it's going to create a frenzy of worry without a resolution or any sort of hope once we tested the babies and they were negative after po the shells being positive probably because the female had wrapped around the eggs breathing on them during maternal incubation before before that we collected them for incubation or you know whatever viral particles are present from the cloaca from feces or whatever uh right. you know when they're going through the cloaca so there, there's a couple reasons why the eggs could have tested positive but they may or may not have been infectious and then Nidovirus only lasts so long um, outside of the host, so a lot of environmental things will kill it after so long and various disinfectants and stuff. So after 50 days of incubation, um, you know, it's, it's probably safe to say when those animals come out, the virus that was on the egg is probably not infectious at that point. But, um, you know, it's still worth noting. And then once we had something to take to the people, uh, we were like, all right, let, now is the time because now we have some light at the end of the tunnel. like. Don't don't burn your collections if you test positive for this thing. You know you can manage you can manage and still breed in nidovirus positive animals if they're clinically healthy. Uh, but you just have to manage it properly. Different building is preferable. Um, working at different days of of the week and and not working in conjunction with your clean known clean collection and stuff. Um, and a lot of it's just kind of common sense too, but we're still in the infancies of, of really learning and managing stuff. And, and, but, 
but a lot of it's kind of common sense husbandry practices, different forceps for different rooms and disinfecting the forceps or, 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 or equipment in between each animal and, um, you know, just doing those things to help prevent transmission, um, you know, because it's not known that it's, a, a, it's an airborne thing. It's, it's more likely, um, you know, uh, aerosolized particles landing in a di water dish, they drink it or breeding or animals come in contact with each other, maybe drink out of the same water bowl or, you know, defecate and, you know, it's in the feces and they crawl through it or, or something, yeah. you know, so it's, you know, there, there's some more logical answers. People just tend to jump right to, you know, pandemonium before like level-headedly thinking things through. And I'll tell you, it wasn't a good feeling, you know, watching 15 snakes wheezing and, and medicating them every other day with different meds, trying to keep them alive and in the game and watching, right. you know, $10,000, you know, designer green tree pythons die and just going, oh, great, you know, like, well, there goes, there goes all of that, you know, and, and not only Gee. like the financial, the financial yeah. crippling part of that, um, the emotional part, just watching those beautiful animals die a, a horrible, horrible way uh, was awful, you know, there's really no, I, I wouldn't want anybody to go through that, but there, there is a lot of people that are going through right now, there's a lot of people that are testing for these, these viruses, and they're, they're having issues, but but because of our misfortune and, 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 you know, fish head diagnostics being born out of that testing for, for NIDA virus and, and uh, you know, making it a little bit more accessible for the, the common person to do an at-home test to, to at least see if their animal is positive and then consult veterinarians for additional stuff. You know, we always suggest, you know, consulting a veterinarian, you know, we, we don't just suggest, we, we totally, you know, it's like that, that's what we support. Um, you know, don't take it under your own thing to say, oh, it's it's wheezing. You know, all you know, reptile medicine for the layman is is a bottle of Batril. You know, a bottle. Oh, just give it a bottle of Batril, a couple shots, and it's back in the game. You know, you you don't know. You know, different different medications do different things. Batril isn't a isn't a cure all drug. You know, there are different ailments that different drugs are are more suited for. Uh, 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 Batril is is uh, uh it's a, what they call a heavy hitter drug like that that's a that's one that you you bring in when when it's needed and it's not something you want to use willy-nilly like and you do, you do, definitely don't want to use it on your own just because you think that that's what you need to do you need to have testing done and you need to have a veterinarian look over that, that stuff and say this is the drug you batril is what you need amicacin is what you need uh, ceftazidime or whatever is what you need to help treat the clinical, you know, symptoms. It's not going to get rid of the virus, but it may keep your animal in the game to where it doesn't die, like, you know, and recovers, you know, just like you get a virus, you know, you, you take meds to, to make you feel better and get you in the game, but it's not ridding you of that virus. You know, there's no, there's no vaccine for nidovirus and because it's snakes and not humans, it's probably unlikely that there will be a vaccine made for nidovirus in snakes. So, um, you know, we're just going to have to deal with what what we have, and uh, you know, be more in the know, be smarter on who you're acquiring animals from. But sometimes it doesn't even matter. You know, even the best facilities and zoos and whatever, you know, these these things fall through the cracks. But um, you know, because animals hide illness very well. Um, you know, we, we had a speckled forest pit viper that was, was captive born and we raised from a neonate and it was the, the epitome of health. And one day I found it upside down and it was acting weird and rolling around and, and we, we, we euthanized it and sent it in for necropsy. And, uh, you know, I thought it was paramyxovirus, which was something that was more commonly seen in vipers. And it turned out to be cryptosporidium. And I was just like, what? You know, this is a, ca a captive born animal that was thriving. Where did this come from? You know, was it something from the adult that was transmitted to the baby? And, and, and you know, it just, you know, because some animals could live with crypto for years and not have any clinical symptoms and be passing those protozoans and whatever uh, to other animals and, 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 and 
creating problems. And it's just like, where does this shit come from? But it does, you know, and, it, and, and instead of just hiding your head in the sand, just embrace it and figure out how to be better. You know, how to identify things earlier if you can. But yep. I think, it, you know, it's one of those things that's just a part. If you're going to do this, get used to it and 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 own it and and learn about it um yeah. because it's it it's not about your bad husbandry it's really not it's just something that's there you know these viruses and stuff it's not just because your bad husbandry created a virus viruses have their own species and subspecies and they've been around for millions of years just like all these snakes and stuff and these things have been infecting these animals for for all of those years as well you know it's not just some Something new to herpetoculture. Herpetoculture just condensed it because it's like now you've got all these snakes from all over the world in same rooms and 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 and, and protozoans and and viruses and bacteria of all these things. You know, an Asian snake, a South American snake, a Papua New Guinea snake, an Australian snake. You know, a, a, an American snake. You know, like all in the same room that have different pathogens all mixed together that we don't really fully understand that would never have been interacted with each other at any other occasion um you know and they're all in the same room so it's kind of like uh it's kind of like a crock pot of uh of bullshit <laughs> you know and viruses that that could happen from from that stuff so i'm pretty sure I want to say 93% of the people who watch this is going to have a nightmare of Nido tonight, but it is what it is. What are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, usually when, when I hop on these, uh, on these, on these kind of interviews, it's definitely something that comes up because it's kind of been something that we've been spearheading yeah. and, uh, it's a terrible piece of reality. People just don't want to face It's just because it sucks. And it's like, and it's something where like, you can try to ignore it all you want, but then when you have people like yourself, Cody, who come on here and state the facts and facts are facts, you know, like I think I had a couple people say, all right, I'm out of here. Like they left. They're just like, fuck, this is scary. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause yeah. It is. Yeah. It, it, it definitely is. You know, when I was telling Forrest about all of this stuff, he definitely wasn't, wasn't too thrilled about it, but you know, I yeah. think anybody who has a, a seriously large collection of, of pythons, green trees, ball pythons, uh, Morelia, you know, all your different carpet pythons and stuff, um, you know, if you have more than 20 snakes and you haven't acquired them and done all the proper quarantine and tested them and made sure that they were negative, I, I would bet you got a sleeper in your collection somewhere with nidovirus. And, and this isn't some fear mongering stuff to get people freaked out, but I've, I've just seen it. I've seen it in other people's collections and I've been a part of the research and, 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 and I know the collections that, it, you know, these animals that, that it's in, you know, um, and uh, there's so many more, but it's like, it, it's just one of those things. Like it's just, it's just there. So, so what are you going to do about it? You know, it's like, if you're not testing everything, at least if you have an animal die, he crops it. You, you, we always talk about our herd health the herd health of the collection, you know, when you have a large animal collection, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily just about that one individual. If that one individual dies, don't disregard why that animal died and think, you know, you know, so many times where I thought I knew on necropsy, I was shown how much I didn't know and how much I still have to learn. And so, so don't think, you know, why it died. And don't don't cheap out on the necropsy because it will give you insight on how to manage your collection next. Because if you have an yeah. animal that dies and you test for uh, you know uh, paramyxovirus, let's say in our in our re venomous collection, and, and that's a virus that that can can be found in other types of, of snakes and lizards and stuff, but but vipers and rattlesnakes and in, in, in specifically seem to be hit very hard with paramyxovirus. So, so let's just say you had a rattlesnake that died, you know, I would test that. And if it comes back and people go, oh, yeah, I, I, I tested and, and, and nothing came back. Well, that's a good thing. That's good. That's some peace of mind that it, might, it was individual amongst that animal. And it was, you know, maybe there was something wrong with some organs or something 
else or a bacterial infection that, you know, whatever, but it wasn't a virus. And so you learned something. You have that document, you learn something on that animal. We have necropsies of animals that are so rare and so so infrequently kept in zoological collections or private collections that when they die and we necropsy them, we have a historic part of literature learning a little bit more on the insides of the animals and how they tick and what 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 makes them die, you know? And so 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 think of it as something that that is a tool for the future and a little window of insight into to the herd health of your collection. Because if you test it, now let's say you test positive, you know, you, you test that rattlesnake and it tests positive for paramyxovirus. Okay. And then you had another rattlesnake die and another one. Now you go, all right, we're dealing, we're dealing with an outbreak. Like th- th- then you know what's happening. You don't go, oh man, what's going on? What's my husbandry like? Oh, did I do something wrong? This is something now at this point, it's out of your control, but you can manage it by, okay, like we're, we're only handling these things on this day. We're, we're thoroughly, you know, we were thoroughly sanitizing our equipment before, but now we're going to double and triple our efforts. We're conscientious of what we're doing. We're, we're, we're sanitizing every holding can. We're waiting the 10 minutes uh, of, of, of time that it takes for the disinfectant to thoroughly kill everything in the can before we wipe it out and stuff. You know, these right. are things that, that people will just have to do. And what we do now, you know, it's, it's not fun. You know, it takes extra time and it's frustrating and we still see issues. You deal with exotic animals, you're going to see issues. I just can't stress it enough. And, and, um, it's nothing to, to, to care people, you know, be, I guess, be, yeah, yeah. To, yeah. It's uh, definitely not fear mongering. It's just a matter of fact. And if you deal with, uh, if you talk to any of these major zoos and venom labs and stuff, they'll, they'll tell you they've had their fair share of outbreaks of different things and have learned to manage them better and stuff. And, and I hate it, man. I hate when, when, when an animal dies, you know, the first thing I do is I blame myself because I think, what keep did going, I do Cody, husbandry Cody, wise? Keep, Cody, keep, keep going. Keep talking. Sorry. Just keep talking. Yeah. Yeah. And at first, you know, I think what, what I, what I did husbandry wise that, that led to that animal's death. And then after we get a necropsy done, you know, and it comes back as a, um, you know, a virus or whatever you go, okay, well, you know, I couldn't. Have, the only way you could have prevented that is if if you you got that test and you the animal tested positive then and you were able to you know uh, disposition that animal however you see fit. But but otherwise, once they got it, if the animal died, it's not because you your temperatures were off or your humidity your humidity was off. It was because the animal had a virus and and it was just you know it wasn't going to make it through that. So. Um, yeah, it's no fun. It, it it's definitely no fun losing animals, and uh, yeah, I'm uh, I, I never get used to it. I'm sure. I'm sure. Even talking about it isn't easy. So that's why I really appreciate everything you're like telling us right now. And I and I've you told me this before over the phone, and you know what I mean. Like if I, I listen to stuff like this, you know, I've always I've always said I'm not always been the best listener, but like this hobby, like it just taught me to listen. And when you got in, people, you know, somebody like Cody who's given us this kind of information, you just got to listen because it's the actual truth. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you're, you're sharing your fucking nightmare with us. And um, all you're trying to do is prevent from people having to go through it themselves. You know what I mean? So we should really just take these practices seriously and also implement it to our customers, um, people who are new into the industry. Because you gotta understand how many new people are fucking just starting up Instagram accounts. I mean, it's growing by the day, bro. Like it's huge. I don't can't even tell you how many fucking exotic names are out there or how many morphs this are out there. It's just so much, bro. It's just growing. But um, yeah, man, I, I'm telling you, man, it's it's a day by day thing. And I th- I feel like us, you know, people who have been in this, you know, not really been, but people who have already kind of established themselves, if they could kind of pick up these new habits and. And, and, and stick to them and just pass them down to the next person. I mean, that's, that's the best way to start it, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And as far as talking about it goes, it, it, it's definitely not hard for me to, to talk about it. it. I don't think it ever was. I, I it just like, I'm, I'm not happy that, 
are like we lost so many animals because of it. Um, but but I I have no problem talking about it because somebody somewhere is going to get value from it. And the more I talk about it, the more it makes me think about it. And and like you know, just get just gets me thinking about the bigger picture and how to how to manage things better and 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 everything. And it's something that needs to be talked about. My misfortune is going to help. Um, you know, our misfortune is going to help others. Um, and and others that have already experienced this stuff are also able to then pass it on. And by us being outspoken about it um, and letting people feel like they're not a complete piece of shit if they got a virus, that you know they're they're more willing to to actually seek advice from from somebody who is not gonna belittle them for having a virus. You know, I, I it's so funny because when we started really heavily coming out about virus uh, night of virus, it was it was hilarious because in a in a couple weeks on all the forums and stuff, suddenly everybody is a armchair expert about nidovirus and they know everything there is to know about it and its transmission. And the, and the funny thing is we're dealing with the researchers that are writing the paper. Hey, wait, 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 so if you donated something to the Southeast carpet fest to nidovirus, that doesn't make you an automatic fucking like you're, you you know, that doesn't give you some sort of a stripe or like, Hey, I donated motherfucker. Oh yeah, no. I mean, for the two the the, the car, two carpet fests that were here, man, we we got. I don't know what the number is, but I know it, you know it was tens of thousands of dollars that were raised for nidovirus research that went into different different labs and and universities to fund different research applications on nidovirus. Um, so so it's really you know the nidovirus panel that we had out here, a team of virologists and veterinarians, and it was it was it was just you know phenomenal. Um, but uh, it's uh, what, what was what was I saying before before you said that? I can't remember. Um, uh, well, you. Oh my god, I don't even know, bro. To be honest, I have no clue. No, 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 no. You don't remember, but yeah. uh, it was. Wait, what no, were you I saying? can't. I can't. We were okay. Well, hold on. It was uh, about sharing. No, wait. Was it about sharing the NIDO knowledge? I don't know. I just know this whole thing's been about NIDO. Definitely. For like the last... Well, people, 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 people are definitely sharing the NIDO virus right now, and that's what we're <laughs> trying to 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 to, to, to limit. <laughs> that that that's for damn sure. But <laughs> that's but, fact. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, that's that's a fact. Oh no, what I was saying is that people were coming out being being experts about the virus. Oh, we're right, talking right, right, to the right. researchers. Yeah, right, we're right. talking to the researchers in the beginning about the virus, and they, and, and they, they've got the, the millions of dollars worth of equipment, right? And and they give us, they go, well, yeah, we we don't really know that yet. But yet here here here's this person on on Facebook telling everybody about nidovirus and and ins and outs and all of this other stuff. And the authorities on the subject, with the equipment to actually have resources to learn about it, don't know. Well, how does this guy that just found out about nidovirus, you know, from our Green Tree Python radio podcast, you know, two months earlier, now this guy knows more than us about it, and everybody is coming out saying, putting in their two cents, and and that's the thing is is be careful who you listen to, cite your yeah. sources, and make sure it's coming from a reputable source. You know, Pia, uh, her her one of her quotes that I love to to use is "empty barrels make the most noise." You know, so the people that are the loudest spoken online and so sure of themselves, you you better double check their facts because the loudest person in the room is not necessarily the smartest or the one that knows, uh, you know, that much. So. Uh, but yeah, I thought I remember I remember seeing all of the, the posts and I would just keep my mouth shut, which is kind of hard to do sometimes because you're seeing this stuff and you're like, <laughs> you know what? I'm just I'm just not even going to jump in here because it's just not worth my time because nobody's going to listen anyway, because everybody, you know, uh, another another Pia quote that's uh, that has to do with the barrel is you can't you can't fill a closed barrel. So. If, 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 you know, somebody thinks they know everything and they think they know more than you, you know, 
and they're in their closed barrel, no matter what what facts and legitimacy you throw at them, they're not going to hear you because their ego is too loud. Their ego yeah. and they're they're full of themselves nature is too loud, and you're just not going to hear it. They're not going to hear what you have to say. Um, you know, I, I I think that that there's a correlation with that on the free handlers too. You know, they they justify you know their their knowledge of the animal and the understanding and 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 all this other stuff, but they're missing the bigger picture and they're really not taking in the 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 the, the severity of the uh, and the nature of the the beast there. So yeah. Fuck so yeah. what are some what are some what are some what are some other questions moving on? I'm gonna. I, I, I got now it's, it's, gonna, it, it, it's time for hot seat questions to be honest i mean we we got we got the uh we got the uh the free handling fucking thing situated um yeah i wanted to hear a little bit about you and forces come up your bites which we heard and we got the fucking we literally got everything i needed in three and a half hours i'm very impressed i'm surprised i'm very surprised is like that else? we got is it is it has that already been three and a half hours it's been three and a half hours, yeah, and it's. It, I mean, it blew by quick because, like you said, man, you, this is everything you're saying has been so intriguing, so interesting that it like this is kind of like what it's like talking to Cody on the phone. You, if you don't look at your phone and you just listen to him, you look down, you'll see it's been fucking an hour and a half, two hours, and you're like, holy shit! And he's not stopping; he just keeps going. So, um, no, man, this is this has been amazing. I, feel, I mean. I I feel I, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep talking, but I'm gonna be in the other room. I'm gonna get I, I'm parched again, and I need another uh, another beverage. Yeah, but well, I feel your, like these these get your beverage for the uh, hot seat questions because you need to get ready for this one. Okay, I I um I can you still hear me all right in the other? Yeah, I can uh, hear you room? fine. I can hear you fine. Thanks to everyone who's been here uh, this entire time. This has been an amazing time. I told you, Cody would be something you don't want to miss in uh. Yeah, man. Thanks for being here. Friday night's been great. We're going to wrap it up with these hot seat oh, questions. Oh, it's, you know. uh, it's been, it's been my pleasure. I always feel like when I, when I do these that I'm never, I, I never get fully what I, what I'm thinking in my head out or I, I don't compose my, uh, my, my thoughts as well as I could. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm here and I obviously am, uh, very, into what we do um you know a little bit of uh you know the background growing up in vegas going going from there to to move into florida to get into the professional zoological realm you know I, for the people that don't know um got my foot in the door with uh with uh, uh carl barton at, at med talks and venom laboratories um, oh, yeah. And uh, when I first moved to Florida, um, uh, Forrest, Forrest made uh, friends with, with Robbie Kezzy at, at Glades Herb Farm. And, and uh, you know, when I moved down to Florida, Forrest had already uh, bridged that relationship. So I got my uh, start with Robbie and Robbie was always Robbie and Rob Roy of Glades when, when Glades was still around, uh, treated me really well. Um, and it was always a good time hanging out with those guys. Um, I, I was able to be the venomous reptile, uh, 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 the venomous uh, venomous collection manager for uh, for Glades for a little bit, and managed the the venomous rooms and you know maybe a hundred different species of venomous and and multiple hundreds of, of individuals, and and that was that was a great time, which which led me into. Uh, you know, I was working with Carl Barnett at Med Talks and Venom Laboratories. Had the luxury of living, living with Carl for a few months uh, up until I was able to uh, get a uh, interview at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm Zoological Park in uh, right. St. Augustine, Florida. I went, I went out to uh, a dinner with uh, with some some zoo people, um, and uh, and uh, Kevin Torgosu was the curator of reptiles there at the time. He's a he took a reptile collections manager position at the Bronx Zoo, and, and we're still uh, really, really good, close uh, friends. I'm actually sending the Bronx Zoo some uh, little captive-born yellow blotch palm vipers that we produced back in August uh, here pretty soon. But um, yeah, Kevin was Kevin was at the dinner, and and you know I was wor uh, living and working at Carl's place, and it's kind of a part-time gig because because Carl wasn't in need of a full-time person, but. Um, the lease was up on our place in Sanford in Florida when we moved here, when Forrest and, and Dez and I moved to Florida, we had a little place in Sanford. Um, I worked uh, at the Hilton doing some uh, timeshare sales 
And, yep, I mean, uh, yeah. I heard he killed yep. it in that. Show. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, um, Carl, Carl Barden was just down the road in Deland, Florida from Sanford. Uh, Forrest moved to Alaska to work with his dad to, to do some security system stuff to make some more money to put back into reptiles. So, so I, I, I kept the house and we rented it out. Um, and then when the lease was up, uh, uh sales were down at the time of year where the sales are down and, and, and you know in those kind of positions and i got let go of my job at the hilton and the lease was up at our place and uh you know i was friends with carl and carl said why don't you move in with me because because uh, forrest and des went up to alaska and i and then when the lease was up um you know we just moved, i just moved out of that place and carl said why don't you move in with me and uh you know well uh and until you you know, get on your feet figure out what you're going to do so i got that awesome opportunity of, of living and working at med talks and venom laboratories and the reptile discovery center and, and living with carl and getting all the the life lesson principles for carl he gave me you know a few different uh, uh good life lessons to live by and principles and uh then then uh uh, uh denise and brew who is uh the, the assistant director of the of the med toxin venom laboratories and reptile discovery center at the time was out uh at uh, was going out to dinner with a bunch of zoo people one of them being kevin torgosa the curator of reptiles at saint augustine we had met the a year or so previous at the daytona reptile expo he was just hanging out and we had a conversation so he knew who i was and i was talking with him and he's like hey man you know uh, you should put in a, we have a job opening for a reptile keeper position and you should put in your resume. And uh, he's like, yeah, I've, I've looked through about a hundred applicants and, and, and you by far, you know, one of the most qualified. So, so I would do it. And I was, I was very, um, I was very excited because I, I, I did not have a formal degree, a biology degree or anything that that most of the, the people going into the zoo world say that, that you need to have. I had a lot of a lot of grit and work ethic and elbow grease and putting myself around people that are in places doing things that I wanted to do. And that's kind of the route that I took. And Kevin himself also did not have a degree. He, he, he took that same route. So so we had a lot in common. And, 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 and Jim Darlington, who is the current curator of reptiles, who's been at the farm for you know, 20 plus years. He all, uh, one of the most experienced crocodilian people alive. He actually married P and I on, on, on Maximo's platform at, at St. Augustine Alligator Farm. Maximo's a 16 foot saltwater crocodile. We had a really cool wedding there, but Jim, Jim was our, uh, you know, our, our officiary. And so those guys are all like family, but, but Kevin at that time was, was curator reptiles because, because Jim left the, the farm for a little bit. Or else, or else he he likely would have been curator at that time. But Kevin stepped up as curator. Jim was assistant curator, and then when Kevin took the position at the Bronx, Jim uh, stepped up to to the curator at the house. But these guys are all still great friends. And uh, when Kevin said put in the interview, put in the resume, uh, Carl Barton, uh, who was really good friends with everybody at the farm, colleagues and everything, uh, wrote me a seriously amazing recommendation letter. Uh, which separated my application and resume from people that came from other zoos or had degrees and looked better on paper than I did. You know, I, I, I wanted that job more than anybody, but on paper, you know, my resume wasn't very long at, at that point. So I didn't have a lot, you know, I had a lot of experience, but it was all private experience. And a lot of the zoo world want experience in a zoo to get into a zoo, but how do you get experience in a zoo if you've never worked in a zoo? So it's kind of like, you know, a double-edged sword. Um, but but they put, brought me in for an interview and uh, long story short, I got the, the position and I, I spent, I was there from 2010 to 2015. Um, I uh, loved my time there. I'd probably still be there if I didn't get offered a position at the Phoenix Herpetological Sanctuary as a curator of reptiles, did that for a year. Um, like I said, we were on two separate pages there. So resigned, moved back here. Pia got the job at Disney. I did the Condro thing for a little bit and bred and sold a couple, you know, uh, the, of the venomous projects that we had, you know, produced some animals and sent them off to, 
you know, uh, professional private individuals and zoos and venom labs and, and whatnot. And then I realized I don't really want to make a living breeding and selling venomous animals uh, for a few different reasons, but I really loved the zoological route. I loved being in the zoo field and uh, that's, 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 that's the, the, herpet, the herpetologist and herpetoculturist that, that I really love. I love the zoo world. I, I, I really dig it all, but I really like that zoo feel. And we're in a position with you know, all the permits that we hold and we maintain here. Um, we have all of our exhibition license for crocodilians and venomous reptiles. And the collection that we boast, you know, we have um, around 50 different species of uh, venomous currently, um, and, it, and, it, and it continues to grow, as well as our uh, crocodilian collection. We have uh, multiple species of crocodilians here. The big, big interest of ours is, is that conservation and, and, and uh, you know, just, just all reptile conservation, really. But, uh, you know, Abronia. Uh, palm vipers in some of these uh, cloud forest setups and or, or environments and, and what have you. Um, but uh, crocodilians and venomous are really, uh, you know, what what really gets us going. But um, hey, so go, since, go since then, you know, and just ring the bell. I wanted to know if you I wanted to bring this person up so you could just, I don't know, maybe give him a break or something because he was he's, his heart was in the right place. You know what I mean? And I, I just heard he just wasn't really liked to might like that much. So he he disappeared. You know who I'm talking about? <coughs> uh I don't know. Who's that? that? Conservation Carl. Oh god, is he is he is he is he on right now? No, he's not on. He's gone. I haven't heard from him. He dipped out. He's I already fucking just left. Uh, Took his visa and is never coming <laughs> back. I heard he's never coming back. Uh, so, anyways, I just want to let you yeah, know yeah. his heart was in the right place. He was trying to give he was trying to give a good message. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, on what's important, he just felt really bad. Yeah, no, no, I yeah, I, to I totally get it. But um, but yeah, so um, we 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 love conservation, Carl. <laughs> I didn't know if you were gonna bring bring him on. Yeah, I didn't know, oh, man, no. conservation, Carl is gonna be. <laughs> this has been going. So, this has been going so well. I'm not going to ruin it by bringing that guy on here. Don't even worry about it. Oh uh, man, um, but yeah. So so um, we've been moving forward on our and and growing our open to the public zoological facility. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. Um, you know, the, every, everything costs so much from the permits and land and and and. You know, everything that develops it but but really uh doing work with the general public is really who we need to convince to do more for the the planet and do stuff like one of our mottos for the reptile preservation institute is conserve like no one's watching and what that basically means is 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 don't do it just for the likes don't do it just for the accolades of like like being a conservationist or saying hey i'm like i could say oh like i've got these these rare palm vipers and i'm doing it for conservation it's like well they're ambassadors to show people about these animals in the wild and their plights and stuff you know having good genetic uh makeup of these animals to to, to have and, and whatever in a captive setting is it is important but by do, having these animals in enclosures doesn't really do a whole lot to conserve them in the wild other than be ambassadors. And we enjoy them, obviously, or else we wouldn't keep them. But, but, but that's not conservation. You know, you hear a lot of things like, uh, you know, conservation through commercialization. If, if we keep animals in, um, in captivity and breed them and sell them, then it takes the heat off of wild populations uh, being, uh, being collected. And there is some truth to that, but but really, it's not, not necessarily the cap the collection of, of animals that is the leading cause of decline. It is a part of it, depending on the populations of said animal in a certain area. But really, it's agricultural development and farmland and and and, and all kinds of other outside factors that have nothing to do with collection. Um, these are the things that are really declining the populations of animals. So conserving like no one's watching is doing things 
that you, you're not trying to be popular for doing, but are going to make an impact in one way, whether it's a community of some kind, even in your own backyard. You know, if you're doing, you know, snake removals and education and teaching people why not to kill a snake in their backyard, you're doing something more than just the average thing. And, and you don't have to post it on Facebook or Instagram. We're doing a conserve like no one's watching thing on Instagram right now for the Patreon. It's kind of an oxymoron because it's conserve like no one's watching. They're not Patreon, but on Instagram and Patreon. But like about about doing something, you know, uh, like going out and picking up trash somewhere and, and tagging uh, Reptile Preservation Institute with conserve like no one's watching. But just to get the ball rolling, right? Like, hey, we're picking up trash. There's an area that's, you know, uh, maybe 10 miles, 15 miles down the road from us. Beautiful, like, um, you know, water, water lettuce and, and, and duckweed, uh, like, like a, a swampy Florida looking environment. You know, big, beautiful uh, egrets and, and herons and all kinds of aquatic, uh, you know, life turtles and, and fish and all this stuff. And there's gate and alligators, and there's just trash everywhere. There's just literally so much on the side of the, 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 the freeway. It's disgusting. So our crew, we're gonna go, we're gonna pick a day and we're gonna go out there and we're gonna do a little like Facebook live thing. And we're gonna get out there and we're gonna pick up as much trash as we possibly can and 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 encourage people to pass it forward because there's just literally so much trash. Take some time out of your day to go pick up trash. And you know, these are things that some animal may eat or something. And, and, and yeah, we're promoting it on a social media platform, but, but it's to encourage people to do it without having to be on social media to do it. And it's not just about keeping animals in enclosures. It's, it's doing a little bit more. So like you can conserve the world by just picking up a piece of trash. Like, and, and that, that was beat into my head real early on when I was at St. Augustine Alligator Farm is Kevin told me, because uh, like when we would walk by a piece of trash, whether you worked in concessions, gift shop, uh, maintenance, or a reptile keeper, a bird and mammal keeper, if you saw a piece of trash on zoo grounds, you pick it up and you throw it away. And Kevin told me the director, John Bruggen, who's, who's a good friend of, of ours, a family friend now, that that he's liable to, look, to, to fire you on the spot. And if, if you walk, if he saw you walk by a piece of trash, acknowledge the piece of trash and keep going, it, he, he's liable to, to let somebody go on the spot. And, and, and you think, man, that's really harsh. But then you think about like, well, if, the, if you have somebody working for you and you're paying, paying them and they walk by a piece of trash in the facility that they should take pride in and they just say, oh, it's, it's somebody else's problem. Somebody else will pick it up. That's not somebody you want working for your place. So like every time I'd see a piece of trash, it's just habit. Whether I'm, I'm walking down the street, walking through a zoo or doing something else, I'm picking up trash and I'm throwing it away. You know, how yeah. hard is it to do it? When I'm driving on the freeway and I see a bunch of trash, man, it's everything I could do to not pull over and, and start picking up trash. And if everybody just gets in the habit of doing that stuff, it will make the environment a better place because look, at the state of the world right now. We are in a complete shit state of the world. And it is up to us. It's all our fault. Like it's all our fault. And but the great thing is it we we have the control to do better. It's like what here's the thing, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah, that's a good one. That one's solid. You know like so, Cody. so it's like move, moving forward with that, with, with everything we're doing, um, you know, being a, being a conservation facility, a public outreach facility, and then just, you know, trying to do more good and, and be a positive influence on, you know, we're, we're kind of that bridge between the private sector and the zoological sector. You know, we're, we're in that messy middle right now of private going uh, gone public you know like like it's it's like we have the relationships of everybody in the private world that that's also professional as well as everybody in zoological facilities and research facilities and stuff like that so so i, I get the best of both worlds but it, it is a little bit of a messy middle 
but I really, I really enjoy where we're at right now because we have such an amazing collection of animals. And, you know, it was, it was really disheartening to have to breed just to send animals off. I would rather bring people in from the outside that have never seen these animals before and get to share with them what we're doing and how they could do better. We've, we've been all over the world and we've got friends in, in different everywhere where we could bring people in from the outside, just normal people, and get them to be a part of eco tours in Guatemala or the Amazon or Australia and really get normal people that aren't like everybody that's probably listening to this podcast who are all Red, Ready Red Pal fans, you know, to appreciate that world of things um, shown by somebody who's not filling them full of hot air or gelling the danger of, of the animals that they're working with or whatever. Jeff Bob, the, the captain of Miami Dade Venom One, he told me, he was like, venomous reptile work should be boring. And it really is because it's montane or, or montane, montane like high elevation, you know, snakes and lizards, uh, mundane tasks. Like you really shouldn't be getting a rise out of it. It's just, you know, systematic work and it really should be boring. So, it, it, you know, we, we want to. We want to show that normal person that, hey, it, you know, to work a cobra and a mamba and these animals, they're not out to get you. And we're not trying to jump around and then look like a, a moron trying to avoid a bite. Like just them basking and being natural and just doing what they do best is more fascinating than the person involved. Like the, you don't need the personality with the reptile. You just need the reptile. That That's the best. Yep. That is the best. Okay. Good way to, good way right, to top yeah. it off. Okay, now, now, since we're already fucking this deep, you know, and and I'm, you know, listen, I, 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 I can only tell how much fucking gas tank it's, how much gas you still have in your fucking tank of in your plane right now. But I'm gonna have to try to bring you back down before the hot seat questions, though, because I just want to know, and this was an important one, and this is for Riley as well, because I know Riley's in the house. Give me your favorite forest moment. My favorite forest moment. Yeah, it could be a story. Um, a thing he did. I don't know. Just give me your favorite memory of forest because I would. I want to know too. Oh man, that's gonna be a tough one because literally they're they're all they're all so good. Um, they are. Yeah. If one if, <laughs> if one if one sticks out, just let me know if one sticks out and if you could just hook up me and Riley and let us know what that is. That'd be great. And everyone else. Um, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, I'm trying to rewind all of the, all the stuff in my <laughs> mind of all of our, all, all of our antics. Um, jeez. Oh, um, uh, gee, uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm gonna tell a story. I don't know if it's my if it's the top one, but it is a pretty funny one. We okay. it was uh, Pia, uh, our our friend Joe Perkins, who is here in Florida, uh, okay. and is a really good friend. He's like he's he's the best. Um, and and Forrest and we were driving Forrest Prius, uh, oh, to the Arlington to the Arlington show. We were going to pick up a pair of rough scale pythons um, for our collection, and we were uh, going to pick up a pair of Philippine cobras and uh, a Samar cobra from Dallas Zoo for the St. Augustine alligator farm. Those animals were uh, were being uh, sent to St. Aug, and instead of we were already going to the Arlington show, so we figured we would uh, we would go to Dallas Zoo, pick them up, save on the shipping, and then just get to hang out with the Dallas Zoo group. And um, so we went and picked up the Cobras, got to Tordala Zoo. It was a great time. You know, did the show, picked up the Carinata. Uh, Forrest and I are like, you know, we would, for, for a while, we would call each other best friends. And Forrest would continue to say that. But after a certain time, I said we were more like brothers than, than, than best friends because we loved each other. But we also kind of hated each other all the time, too, because it was constant art. We had a lot of great conversations and we were always really excited about stuff, 
but we we would we would not always see eye to eye on everything and a lot of our times were like uh arguing about stupid stuff like tubs versus cages and you know dumb shit like that where like it would, we'd both get really mad and storm out of the room and and then everything um so Forrest was pissed off about something and <laughs> J- Joe like in the Prius, you know, you could lay the you could lay the Prius seats down, right? So there's no seat. So they so Joe and 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 for P and I were in the front seat of the Prius. I'm driving, um, and Forrest and Joe have an air mattress blown up in the in the back of the Prius. So they're just like living in luxury, and and it was like you know because we had the snakes up in the front and everything, and we're trying not to get them too cold or whatever. So I was like, we're keeping yeah. AC down, so this so these so these things don't don't freeze or whatever and force is freaking out he had long hair at the time or whatever you know like probably down to his, his shoulders and uh we, we and and he was like he's like bro you got to turn on the air it's too hot in here i'm like no man we're not gonna we're not gonna you know we got the snakes in the car we got to keep you know it's got to stay like this and he goes nobody boy. sweats me at- Oh, you know, he gets so mad. He goes, nobody sweats me out of my own car. And he rolls down the back window and sticks his head out the window. And you got his hair like he looks like a frilled lizard with his hair all up in the thing. And he's just so pissed because I'm like, hey, Forrest, if you want to drive, you, you could get in the front seat. And you could drive. And he didn't want to drive. So I was like, I'm, I'm not turning on the air. He goes, nobody sweats me out of my own car. You know, Joe was laughing. Oh, my God. It it was was a pretty good one. (laughs) He hates being uncomfortable, dude. And he hates being sweaty. He doesn't like being hot. And and, and that's when he – I mean, that's the only time I've ever seen Forrest (laughs) flustered and, like, not in a good mood is when he was sweaty or hot or, like, something like that. So I could just imagine him in that Prius not having a good time and fucking but you know there's snakes what are you gonna do i've been, i've been miserable in my car because of the heat like i needed heat on but forrest yeah. being miserable yeah. oh man if he's miserable everyone else is miserable too i'll tell you that much oh i'm telling you and and and, and pia was oh 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 dude i i got him you know i'm gonna this is probably this is probably my favorite one you want to talk about a hot seat forrest would probably be like not so happy or he'd probably yeah. roll with it, but it's it, it it it's got it's got to be said. It's got to be said because Joe is really going to appreciate this. This was this this another Joe Perkins, uh, you know, story too, because because a lot of the great stories are, are with Joe. But Forrest and Joe um, came over uh, like years ago, and we were just hanging out. We were partying. We were you know we were drinking a ton of Sailor Jerry's rum, and and you know we 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 put them on the we oh yeah oh we put we put down some drinks that night and um and I, and I you know so it's like uh, you know three in the morning or whatever it is and we're like all right we're going to bed pull out the sofa couch or whatever and Joe and and Forrest are you know uh, weird thing was they were in they were in bed together a lot I don't know what that means but but you know so here they here they are. Yeah, yeah, they're in the they're they're in the pre the back Prius with the air mattress in there, you know, and now they're on the the the, the rollout mattress on the couch. But um, so so we go to bed and I wake up and I open the I open the door to our bedroom and uh, Joe Joe is on the ground with you know whatever blankets or whatever he could wrap on himself and um, and uh, Forrest is is on the mattress. And he's got the covers up to his face, and he he pulls him, you know, like I, I look I look on the on the ground, and jo, Joe's Joe's awake, but he doesn't look he doesn't look happy at all. He's pissed. He's like, you know, he's just giving me this look. And then and Forrest got the covers up to his face, and and he's like, you know, just got this funny look. And I look at Joe, and I go, "What's going on? You know, what the hell's going on here?" And 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 Joe just like he's like without skipping a beat, he goes. Forrest pissed the bed, and, and he oh goes, my God. For, 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 Forrest pulls down the blankets. He goes, I, I, I fucking pissed the bed, bro. And and like literally the whole mattress was, was oh like God. completely saturated, saturated in, in, in Forrest's in piss. Bed. And oh my God, and, it must and, have been. And, cool. and, and it, it was so. It was so it was so funny. And, and the best the best part about it was 
Then Pia comes out behind uh, me and, 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 and she goes, oh, little Forrest wet the bed or little, oh, little Forrest beat the bed. And, and it was just like, he, he just got so, so drunk. Oh, well, no, Joe, Joe goes, go, he, he goes, he pissed the bed and he pissed all over me. Like literally, like Joe was soaked in piss. And, um, and, and so was Forrest and it was, it was really funny. It was all in good fun. I probably, I probably shouldn't have said that, but you, you put me yeah, in the hot seat. Yeah, as like, ended. We ended, we ended with a story of, of Forrest pissing himself. Oh, well, <laughs> but it was good. But, but it, good. It, it was, it was, it was definitely. Definitely, you know, this is this is the this is the trap talk. So this is like you no know, holds bar or whatever. But no but if you, if you want if you want some yeah if you want some real behind the scenes forest uh, you know um, you know action there that that one was a good one because it was just like and if you would have seen this wet spot oh, if you I, I mean imagine. it was a big, a big it was a huge bed. mattress yeah I bet, it was I bet huge. The mattress was fucking wet. I was I was to be completely honest with you. I was impressed. I was impressed, um, <laughs> you know. And uh, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was the funniest right. thing. If 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 it was me, I would have expected Forrest to also tell the story because it was just too good not to tell. But uh, it's all in good fun and no disrespect. It's amazing, dude. All right, here we go. Hot seat questions. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up right now. Now, with the hot seat questions, there's no explanation behind it. The answer, you just fucking tell. You just gotta, you gotta just gotta shoot them out. Okay, you ready? Uh, we'll see. All right, hot, hot seat questions for fucking Cody. Let's go. Frozen thought or live? Uh, it depends on the animal. I mean, I mean, every okay, every animal will take either frozen thought or live. What would you do? Um, I would do frozen thought if 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 every animal would take either one. Um, for the so eth fun. for the ethicalness for the ethicalness of the rodent because I really love rodents as well we breed them here and I really respect those animals so I don't really like that they go through the terror of being envenomated or constricted or whatever so I'd rather them humanely euthanized and fed uh, humanely euthanized or frozen thawed uh, um, you know and obviously they can inflict damage into the snake but. Um, I would rather uh, deceased prey than live prey, but some animals will only take lives. So you know, for those okay. ones, you got to do it. But 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 yeah, for the ethical reasons, yeah. yeah All right, next one. Prey. Next one, and I can't don't don't do such an explanation. I just need one or the other. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. Well, shit, man. I gotta explain. All right. All right. Okay, I know. I know. Okay. A cut or no cut? What? <laughs> A cut or no cut? What is an A cut or a no cut? Okay, like there's date, like there's no pip. Would you cut or would you not cut the egg? A cut or no cut? Oh, oh, on an, oh, on an egg, on an egg. Okay, um, no cut. If, <laughs> okay, you're not, no. if you're not, if you're not doing an explanation, if you're not doing an explanation, I got an explanation, but yeah. <laughs> no, no cut. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, okay, big flexor or no flexor. What is big flexor or no flexor? Like you like to flex on somebody. Like if you want to flex, you know, like meaning like show off. Yeah. Or just show uh, no off. No flexor. Yeah. Okay. Even even though you flex this entire yeah, four hours. So, you know, you your information flex the shit out of everybody. But anyways. Okay. Here we go. Uh, baseball yeah, I'm gonna football. Be, I'm going to be humble. Baseball or football? I don't like sports. I okay, don't like sports. sports. Oh, that's true. You're not a sports guy. Um um, okay, how about, this? How, about, how about how about how about motocross freestyle or um or uh snowboarding? That's stupid, but whatever. Pick one. Oh, uh, can you can you can you can you keep them in the same genre? Can you do uh, motocross or BMX? Sure, motocross or BMX. Why not? BMX, BMX. Okay. Perfect. Van, Van Halen or Sammy Hagar? Um, Van Halen. All right, there you go. Steak or fish? Ooh, fish. Okay. M and M or machine gun? Too. M and M or machine gun Kelly? Oh, dude, M and M all day long. Water or substrate? Oh, substrate. All right, cool. All right, little word association. First thing to come to mind: milk. 
Um, milk. <laughs> that, that, oh, no, 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 coffee, coffee. Like, it's, it's, I, I, no. I was going to say, coffee. come on. Yeah. Cocoa. Cocoa. Yeah. Um, chocolate. Stuck shed. Night of virus. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh my god that's too much oh my god <laughs> all right last one one has to go forever instagram or facebook oh uh, i guess instagram because i'm pretty fed up with facebook but no wait so facebook oh, wait. has to go Facebook goes. So one has to go forever. Who? What? Which one would you get rid of? Facebook or Instagram? Oh, you know what? Honestly, I changed mine. I, I would. I would get rid of Instagram because Facebook, because of Messenger and all that stuff. I. I have been so lucky to get in contact with so many good people from all over the world because of Facebook, um, and and just the way that the algorithm or how, how I could get in touch with people. It's, but I like Instagram too. I think they're both good. But man, that that's a tough one. But I like, I like, I don't like the drama of Facebook. But I I like the good things of Facebook, if that makes sense. But but Instagram is good too. I I know I'm wordy, but that's my answer. Cody Bartolini, thank you so much, bro. You, you thank you for giving me the longest trap talk in history. Thank you. This is of course it would be you to fucking give this to me. And I appreciate you. Four hours in the books. Rat, would you? Are you going to come back for round two? Will you do that for me, please? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I mean, I'm just getting started. Yes, thank you. And listen, at the end of the day, man, I appreciate you always giving giving me the time of day. You know, anywhere from texting to calling to fucking coming on my podcast. I value your time, Cody. I value your knowledge. I value you fucking putting it out there. Anywhere from showing your fucking shit on Patreon page to the Nido information, man. You are a huge inspiration. And I want you back on the show because I feel like people still need to hear you. And I will give you four hours of my fucking time any time of the day, bro. But thank you so much. Have a good night. And you're the fucking man, Cody. Thank you, bro. Man, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, I'm gonna just do some. Say, can I do some sh uh, sh shameless plugs on some stuff that uh, that we got have going on? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Do do that? Go ahead. Sign okay. off. Okay. Yeah. So um, you could follow us on our uh, you know, talking about Instagram versus uh, uh, Facebook. We do a lot of um, stuff on Instagram for the Reptile Preservation Institute. So if you want to keep up uh, with the latest, uh, follow us at Reptile Preservation Institute on Instagram, um, a similar handle on, um, on Facebook. Uh, we also have a Patreon where we uh, are posting behind the scenes exclusive videos on updates and things that we're, that we're doing around here that uh, Patreons will be the only ones that see um a lot of that stuff that's going on so if you really want to see what's going on um that's a good good place to do it and um we are an open where you at oh his connection's like damn cody you you, you we can't uh, hang with you uh, you there what's Keep that on. oh no, sorry i lost yeah, you yeah. for a second okay yeah yeah um, right. If you if you want to see everything else that we've got going on, um, uh, www.reptilepreservation.org. That will take you to our social media platforms, our Patreon. You can book a tour through uh, the website, and we've got a, a lot of other stuff going on there, so you can um, uh, be up to date on all of the latest happenings. But reptilepreservation.org will get you in, in contact with all of that stuff. I'm pretty accessible through the social media platforms. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm not always punctual about getting back in touch with people. We have a lot going on. If I don't respond back to you, it's nothing personal. Um, you know, it's just hard to keep up with everything. There we go. Um, all right. That is a beautiful, that is a beautiful snake right there. It's like Guatemala clown viper. 
website. I love that platform, yeah, by the way. Yeah. Beautiful website. And I'm going to put all those links in the description below as well, people. So make sure you go down and visit. Check out the Patreon page. I'm telling you, man, his content's amazing. And, uh, yeah, man, thank you, Cody. I hope you have a wonderful night. Give uh, give Pia my love. Uh, maybe we could bring her on next time. That'd be sick. Oh, yeah. She, she's here. She's, she's working on stuff, um, you know, in the other room. Yeah. Like, no, normally – I like to get Pia on the on the on the on the shows too because she keeps me from either talking too much, tells me when to shut up, tells me things that I'm not supposed to say. So she's kind of my chaperone uh, for the better. Um, but uh, yeah, there we go. That was that was a fun day at, uh, at Robbie's place. We had Roman and and uh, and, and Pia and I and, and uh, Julian there. Uh, yeah, th- those guys are awesome. Um, right. But. Uh, yeah. But man, right. if anybody, if anybody's still, if ever, if anybody's still listening to the podcast, I really appreciate li- uh, you <laughs> listening to the rambling for four hours. I know that I'm notorious for it, so if you made it to the end, uh, I really appreciate yeah. it, and um, you know, look forward to to good things from us in the in the future, and right. uh, we'll, we'll be around for round two, man. I, I appreciate you, Jim. Cody Bartolini in the books. Thank you so much, Cody. I'll be in touch, man. I'll hit you up. And, uh, and, and again, I can't thank you enough. This was great, bro. Have a good night, okay? Awesome. You too, man. Later. Woo! Cody Bartolini, everyone. That was fucking amazing. Good shit. Thank you so much for tuning in to the longest fucking podcast session I've had to put out. And this was great. I couldn't pick anyone better than uh, my boy Cody to come on and fucking just tell us some shit that you know, everyone has to hear it. People got to hear it. So respect to Cody, super big respect to Cody, respect to, to his whole you know team that he works with, things that he's working on and, and whatnot, and you know, giving it, passing it down to us so we could go ahead and pick it up and keep things moving, man. So thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Hope you have a wonderful night, have a wonderful weekend, and yeah, man, I'll see you guys next Thursday night. Trap talk with MJ. It's gonna go down, um, and yeah, man, subscribe if you your first time tuning in. If Cody brought you over here, I appreciate it. If you liked it, hit the subscription button. That'd be great. Like, 